I don't, I don't know how to introduce these things, but um, yeah, we're, we're now live. Um, we're talking about Hutton, or specifically we're talking about um, Cold Steel, which is kind of Alfred Hutton's magnum opus or like, you know, most significant, um, probably most notable work, um, not just today, but also in the period. And I kind of wanted to talk about it from the perspective of someone who started Saber with Cold Steel, with the way most people find Cold Steel, which is downloading a PDF of it from somewhere on the internet. Um, and then kind of got into British Saber from there, started finding other sources uh, at the time, particularly before like Google, because this was, you know, Google Books was fairly, was still fairly new at the time. All of this also meant buying reproductions of other manuals, which was kind of interesting. Um, and yeah, I kind of, Certainly was influenced by Cold Steel um, for a long time, but uh, more recently kind of got back into it, decided to start rereading it and see what I thought now as someone who has, one, done a bunch of other Sabre systems, uh, or like work for a bunch of other Sabre manuals, I guess. I, I, how you classify a system versus a manual, I don't know. Um, but also has done a lot more of the supplementary stuff that was around the period. Like I've done some more period foil fencing and epee, I've done knife, I've done a little bit of bayonet, um, although not a particularly huge amount. Um, and yeah, just kind of reflect on how or what my takes are on cold steel now. Um, I mean, I, if anyone's come on the expectation, I'll be like, oh, I did start with Cold Steel, and then I discovered all of these other wonderful methods, and it's a bad system, and blah, 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 blah. Yeah, no, that's not. That's not going to happen. Um, I don't, you know, like, I still really like it. Um, I still think it's cool. I also don't really, like, I'm never really that negative about any system, so if, if you want negativity, I'm, I'm sorry, I'm not, I'm not your person. Um, but, yeah, so this is kind of an interesting one because Cold Steel is probably the most common um, HEMA manual out there. Um, it's certainly like one of the most ubiquitous in terms of you can find it nearly everywhere. Um, like, you know, just, you know, any kind of PDF library, um, pirating websites, if you, you use those, which you shouldn't because the Australian government says no. <laughs> you don't, don't, yes, never go to Pirate Bay and download Cold Steel. Um, yeah, you find it there and often it's not only the only HEMA source there, it's often the only fencing manual um, on those kinds of sites. So it's really, really common and it's really interesting that it got that common because this is, um, well, the digitization of Cold Steel happened in 1999. So that's a full, lot, like, five years before Google Books was even announced. Um, so it's had a PDF that's been out there for a very, very long time um, and it's very common. Um, but it's also kind of been without major, any kind of major figures who have really promoted it. Um, like certainly with other schools of fencing, you have key figures in those interpretation. Whereas with Cold Steel, like um, there's not like there's not really any major public figures in HEMA who are known as Hutnists. So it's kind of been very very silent in the discussion and. Um, I don't know, I think that's kind of led to a lot of really, like a lot of very different interpretations of it, made all more complicated by the fact that because it's the most easy manual to find, there's a lot of people who kind of just dabble in HEMA who just want a saber source who are maybe not the best fences, not the best um, at interpreting manuals, have picked it up, in some cases have made videos, um, and, you know, are visibly not the best fences, and so it kind of, I think, presents Cold Steel as not the best system when, you know, every, all the most visible people doing it are not visibly particularly good. Um, so yeah, it's, it's kind of an interesting one um, because it's also an advanced manual. Like Cold Steel is not for beginner fences. That's Hutton very, very clearly states that early on where he says you should have done foil fencing before you've read this, or you should be proficient in foil. Um, and yet it's the manual that a beginner is most likely to encounter. And that was me. I very you know, multiple decades ago now, because I'm getting old. Um, but that was me. Um, when I first started with it, I was a relative beginner who found Cold Steel. And um, yeah, it and um, yeah, you know, started my fencing journey with that. Um, now I don't, you know, and I think this kind of raises a really good point about 
sources and how we engage with them because how you engage with a text, any text, like in, this is just basic kind of literacy, like literary media theory, really depends on who you are as an audience. So how someone will engage with Cold Steel really, really depends with who they are. Um, and what's really interesting about Cold Steel specifically is who you are really greatly affects the experience you'll have. So from, you know, as a beginner's manual, it's not, it's not a beginner's manual, so it's not very well, it's not very well suited that. I mean, it's not awful, like you will get things from it, but when you're a beginner, most sources will give you something because you don't know anything. Um, but it's explicitly not a beginner's manual and that's a problem because there are things that it just doesn't tell you how to do. Like Hutton doesn't actually say how to lunge in Cold Steel at all. He just assumes that you already know how to lunge. And he assumes you know a lot, like you know what certain positions are um, without telling you. So if you're just picking up Cold Steel as a beginner, there's going to be gaps that you're not going to be able to fill with your own knowledge. Uh, conversely, as an advanced manual, I really like it. I think going back to it, I'm actually getting more out of it um, now as an experienced fencer than I did than I have at any other point in my fencing career. Um, a lot of the problems with it go away when you know how to lunge, you know what the terms are, you know, you know what say like the position of second is, and Hutton only really needs to specify what second is in Cold Steel because it's a bit different to what you would have done in foil fencing. So um, it works really well for it works really well for that, and it gives you a lot of options. Um, and it doesn't like it doesn't tell you which option is best because it assumes that you will work that out for yourself. And so yeah, I, as an advanced manual, I really like it. I think that you know if you've been doing particularly British saber for a while, um, but haven't done cold steel or haven't touched it in a long time, going back to it is actually a really good idea. Uh, but that's not those aren't the only ways we view manuals in HEMA. We also look at them as historical sources. And what we tend to like in HEMA are descriptive sources, sources that will tell us what sword fighting is, what fencing is. And I think this is partially why like Renaissance era texts tend to be particularly popular because they're often philosophical works describing what is the esoteric nature of fencing? What is the, what, it, what even is sword fighting? Um, with Cold Steel, it's not very descriptive of what a sword fight is it's describing drills. It, you know, Hutton gives you a series of drills to do and he describes what things are in the way, in a way that, you know, um, is designed to tell you, you know, so you can use that technical vocabulary or so you know how to do a particular or adopt a position, particular position properly. But like if you look at the way he teaches cuts, there's some vaguety to it and there are multiple interpretations you could make of that. Um, there are also wrong interpretations, which I'll cover later when we get to techniques, but there are multiple interpretations you can make of it um, and all of them are effective. And there's a point where I just started kind of viewing that sort of thing as like in say boxing training, you do some heavy bag um, to work on your power and just, and your cardio, you do some pad work to re you know, work on your accuracy um, and your reactions. And you have different drills that are not necessarily literal breakdowns of boxing. Like you look, like you look the way people punch a speed bag, you don't punch a speed bag the way you punch a person but doing speed bag gets you better at boxing and it's a drill to make you more capable at a thing. And I think Cold Steel really needs to be viewed the same way where it's not super descriptive, it's not super explicit. Um, but you know, the, if you do the drills and you actually follow the exercise within, it will help you get better at fencing. Um, also, if you're watching this for the, from the perspective of trying to work out if Cold Steel is the manual for you, I find that the big deal breaker with it is how descriptive you need it to be. Um, I know a lot of people who really like very explicitly, this is what you should be doing, this is what perfect technique is kind of manuals, really don't like cold steel. People who are like me and just kind of chaos gremlins who want to play with swords and want a manual that is going to make them better at playing with swords um, because you know you mostly learn by doing fun things. Cold steel is really great and like I really this is, I think, why I really glommed on to it early on is because it really suited my learning style. Um, so yeah, as a descriptive historical source that's going to tell you what sword fighting is like, not so helpful. Um, but if you want that, I, honestly, the best thing is actually Swordsman of the British Empire, which are actual accounts of actual sword fights. Um, the other thing you can view it as is as a reference source. So you can jump into Cold Steel, and if you need to know how to do a specific thing, 
go and have a read to it. And it's pretty good as a reference if you're, say, already doing Saber and you just need to add to your game. You want to learn how to do false edge attacks. Go read the false edge drills. You want to improve a particular pattern. Hutton's got a diagram. Um, a you've got a diagram, a just very comprehensive description that will help you learn how to get that position properly, and then a bunch of drills you can do to practice um, adopting the position and reposting from there. Um, and the drills are designed so that you play parrot, like you just go through this sequence that is not in any way simulation a simulation of how actual fencing sequences go, but you get to see the effect of each repost from each pattern. Um, and so it's kind of has this wonderful exploration element. So as a sort, like as a reference, like as something to just go to and check out, it's really, really good. I, I approve of that. Um, yeah, so this is kind of, again, there's, there's no perfect manual. Anyone who tells you that a manual is perfect is trying to sell you that manual um, or is trying to convince themselves that I don't know what the weird consoles, console war stuff, but with HEMA manuals, it's just, I don't understand. Um, but yeah, if you think of it in terms of what it's specifically good for, it I think it makes a huge difference. Um, so this brings us to what is Cold Steel itself. Um, and Cold Steel, it was really probably Hutton's, I don't know if this is his most popular book, but his other more popular, his other books that kind of rival or get mentioned a lot um, are things like old, uh, old Sword Play and Sword in the Century, which are both historical works. And that did generate a lot of interest in Britain at the time. Um, but Cold Steel is kind of Hutton's most prominent work on contemporary fencing. Uh, you look through period sources like newspapers and whatnot. When they talk about Hutton, um, it's, very, it's very rare that they mention another of his contemporary fencing sources like Fixed Bayonets or The Swordsman. Um, and they almost never mention his earlier works um, without also mentioning Cold Steel, but it's very common that they mention Cold Steel without. And there's a lot of references to it as um, a good source to go to for Sabre. Um, you know, even very, like, oh, there's a lot of very standard kind of, this is what fencing is, or, you know, is kind of sources. Um, they nearly all discuss foil fencing. Um, so you get something like the Badminton Sports Library, which was basically an encyclopedia of sport, but mo mostly from the perspective of how to play that game from the period. In their edition on fencing, boxing, and wrestling, they've got a very detailed um, foil section, um, which was you know quite like quite detailed credit, including um, employing one of the few professional fencing instructors or one of two professional fencing instructors from France uh, that were in Britain at the time to write the foil section. And then you get to their section on broadsword and single stick, and it's a brief history and a note that says, and basically notes it saying, um, go read Wait and or and or Hutton um, because these are the two most these are the two best works to read on Saber. Um, so yeah, it's was fit like a fairly well received source. In fact, that to some degree Hutton really wasn't that well known before uh, publishing Cold Steel, but after publishing Cold Steel, Hutton really became kind of. Not a household name, but he was, there's a lot, like he did become kind of famous, like maybe like YouTuber famous where there's a lot of people heard of him, but not necessarily like super famous, like, like as famous as like a famous sports person, like so, you know, the same way that there's a lot of people who might, like, you know, a good comparison might be like Conor McGregor or something or like, you know, a UFC fighter that most UFC fans will know, but most normal people won't. Um, but yeah, Hutton, and this is kind of a thing about Hutton as well. He is was you know is was kind of a celebrity in the day. Like um, there's a lot of no there's a lot of information on him because he was covered in the press quite a bit, um, which means we know a lot about his life. Um, what's really interesting about it is today we tend to think of him as the first humorist, and he really makes an effort to present himself as an early kind of historical fencer. Like you see a lot of pictures of him in uh, pseudo historical costume. Um, but weirdly enough, that's not the thing that primarily gets mentioned when people talk about him. Um, obviously, people talk, you know, he's a very well-respected fencer and was a very skilled fencer, and people note that. Uh, but the big thing he's actually famous for, and the thing that kind of attracted a lot of academic attention, was Hutton is credited as kind of reviving interest in fencing in Britain. So during the 19th century, interesting fencing in Britain really declined. And then toward um, to point where, like, you know, you see a lot of um, French and Italian sources basically complaining that... Britain's a bit of a fencing backwater, and then that starts to turn around in the 1890s and into the 1900s. And while 
Britain was never on par with the great fencing nations like, you know, France, Italy, or Hungary. Um, it was, there's a point where it gets more respect as a good kind of, you know, as a nation that has a good grasp of fencing and can produce, you know, a reasonable number of capable fences. And a lot of that is attributed to Hutton. Um, in fact, I don't know if it's still going, but for a long time, the Alfred Hutton Memorial Cup was a prize for women's fencing, women's foil fencing, that was competed internationally. Um, and that was in honour of the fact that Hutton did a lot of work to get uh, women into fencing, women specific, like, specifically to promote foil fencing to women. Um, he also did a lot of work to get fencing um, taught in schools or like, you know, make it a school sport, uh, which was probably successful, make it accessible to kids. Um, so yeah, he's sort of, his main fame outside of the HEMA community, like even today amongst um, academic historians, is actually as the guy who established essentially the modern British fencing scene. Um, so yeah, it's which I find kind of interesting is obviously we think of him primarily as a um, early humorist and as a saberist, uh, which I find also interesting is a lot of a lot of the fencing Hutton actually did was foil fencing. He just didn't feel the need to publish a work on it, primarily because he felt that it had already been covered quite effectively by the French school. Um, although he does have one work on foil fencing, or does have a section on foil fencing in The Swordsman, um, where he present what he presents is actually quite similar to the standard French military manual uh, written in 1877. Like he's not plagiarizing it, but he is he is obviously taking a lot of inspiration from it, which he also outright says he has done. Um, but yeah, he's very much, his foil fencing was very much, well, the French school is pretty common in Britain, whereas he felt that a work on sabre fencing was very, very necessary. So that's why Cold Steel is 50% a sabre manual, um, which I guess is kind of the other thing that's worth mentioning about Cold Steel. I think a lot of people think of it as exclusively a sabre manual, but it does cover um, advanced fencing of all kinds. So not all kinds, but like, you know, it's sabre as a weapon you do after you know how to do foil. There's also a section on epe. In fact, Hutton is also one of the people, is um, occasionally credited as the person who brought epe fencing to Britain. Um, and he was certainly one of the earliest people doing it and promoting it in Britain. Um, although his epe section is mostly tactical, so it's mostly describing what you should do. Um, and we may or may not be able to cover that tonight. Uh, he's also got a section on knife, which I won't be covering tonight, but I have done a video on that I will post to the Facebook event um, at probably tomorrow after I've slept off all of my like live stream anxiety. Uh, there's also a section on great stick, which um, you actually can see on this channel, um, uh, or like you know if you just look at the old, if you're on Facebook, the old Facebook events, um, which I've kind of covered um, there. He's also, got a, he's also got sections on uh, a section on Constable's Truncheon, which is kind of interesting. He has some advanced foil lessons, and he also has some Sabre versus other weapon lessons. So he talks about how to fence against someone with what he calls the French sword, um, which just means ep basically epée or small sword. He says we, can't, we call it a small sword in Britain sometimes in the section, um, but he refers to it as the French sword. Um, it just means basically epée. Um, and he also has a section on Sabre versus Bayonet, although uh, which I probably will cover primarily because I um, it's I think it's probably the worst section in that a lot of the advice basically boils down to be a better fencer. Um, and if you're looking for good advice on how to beat a bayonet when you've got a saber, I John Mansgrave White has what I would regard as a better chapter. But you know, um, that's kind of thing. Anyway, let's actually bust into the technique. So I'm going to see if there's like a Jacob around here. Um, so I think there's a Jacob. There is a Jacob. Oh, um, cool. Incidentally, it's a Jacob. <laughs> um, yeah, we need like an intro for you, like um, I don't know, intro music. Bring the trumpet. Just a brass section. <laughs> um, cool. So yeah, if you do have any questions or comments, just check them in the questions and comments. I won't respond to them straight away, but I will respond to them. Um, when I get to them, basically, and I can, I will be able to see them. So yeah, if you have any questions or comments, um, I will definitely um, get to them. And yeah, um, cool. I just realised that there were some, so let's help. Uh, cool. So we have some spam. <laughs> yeah, that just 
someone wanting to offer promotion of our channel? No. Um, and oh, and someone's made reference to Cold Steel the Knife Company, <laughs> which yes does cause problems with Google search. Um, let's see. Weird fun fact: uh, Cold Steel was actually, um, or Hutton was actually nicknamed Cold Steel amongst his friends. Like that was kind of a joke thing, thing because of the success of the manual, um, which is just yeah, kind of cool and interesting. So very edgy. <laughs> Hello, Nick. I love how we voice the silence, it's great. Um, cool, so yeah, so mostly I'll look through the same section because that's one, what people associate with the manual, but two, that's half the manual, and um, we go from there. So um, basically, we're going to just start by looking at the guards. So, one of the things actually really interesting about Cold Steel is Hutton says that guards and parries are different things. And he uses the term a bit differently to a lot of, to a lot of maybe contemporaries, um, although probably more similarly to, similar to the way it would be used now, where as far as, far as Hutton's concerned, a guard is a position that you fight from. So you enter a guard to, have a, to be in a position that will help with attack and defense. And if you close the line, that's a good bonus, but that's not its purpose. And a parry is a distinct defensive action. Um, whereas earlier in British sources, guards are both for defence and the position you fight from, and then parries are specifically deflective defences. Um, although we'll, we'll, get, we'll talk about more, we'll talk about that a bit more when we talk about parries. But yeah, for Hutton, um, all parries are in some way deflective. So let's start by looking at his guards. Hutton says there are four principal guards with sabre. He then goes on to reference a bunch of other guards. That he doesn't, but doesn't tell you what they are because he expects that you already know them from coil fencing. Because, <laughs> you know, that's. <laughs> Again, it is an advanced manual. Like, there's transparently advanced manual because there's a bunch of stuff that he doesn't um, tell you. So, his four principal guards um, first is the medium guard, which is basically. This is something that he has adopted straight from the Angelo school and also possibly from foil fencing. The problem with working out which is quite hard because it's in both um, Angelo broadsword and in foil. Um, so yeah, it could be from either, it could be from both. Uh, who knows? But it's this is his principal guard. Like this is all the drills start from here unless he specifies otherwise. And a few years later, when he simplified the system called Steel and wrote the swordsman, this is the only, or not the only guard, this is the prime, the primary guard, he gets rid of the other sort of primary guards to do. You then have uh, what he terms the outside guard, or tierce guard, and he uses the terms a little bit interchangeably, which is frustrating, but it's fully extended, um, arm hold, usually a bit below shoulder height, maybe a claw, maybe a bit less, um, and the blade is not quite vertical, but kind of close to. Um, and he says that this is the medium guard, the primary guards you fight from. Uh, recently, and probably a bit of what inspired this video, was I've been fencing more from the um, I've been fencing more from um, the outside guard a bit. And I, yeah, I think it's cool. I like it. Um, I find the medium guard is a really good teaching guard, and it's a really versatile guard. But it's also it's very much a jack of all trades guard. Like it's yeah, this. There's good things about it, and there's some of you, but there's very few things that it distinctly does. Whereas your outside guard um, is just, you know, um, close the line. Like if Jacob is in, let's say, you know, like the guard of the terminal from the bill, um, if I go to an outside guard, I have now closed the line and I can get close and I can get quite close and basically parry, which is kind of rad. This has the other advantages. If Jacob is in just a normal, some kind of guard, and I'm in an outside guard, then I know that Jacob is probably going to attack to my inside because the line on the outside is closed. So, yeah, I can defend that really easily. So, yeah, I this guard is cool for that, and I think that's kind of why Hartman includes it. He is also like he also breaks from tradition with the extended arm guards. You actually don't see these guards in Britain. You hadn't seen these guards in Britain for about a hundred years. Oh, actually less than that, because the last man, British man you really see them in is Roworth, who was is very much from the early part of the 19th century. Uh, they're very common in the 18th century, and Hutton actually uses uh, Miller 
uh, which is a series of plates written by a backsliding champion in 1711. Um, as the source, like he just reprints the plates because Hutton loves using any historical source he can because Hutton is a massive nerd. Um, but yeah, whereas this the medium guard is much more typical of guards of the period for one, um, and yeah, kind of definitely from the Angelo school, either from its broadsword system or possibly as inspired by foil. But in all in really in reality, probably they just want to use the one guard for both. Then I'll have the inverse of the outside guard, which is the inside guard. Well, as you were saying, the medium guard is not particularly good at anything. I will disagree in one thing. I think the medium guard is great if you're really close. Yeah? Because while it's nice to be able to close off a line when you're close, it's also really quick to come around that you're yeah. standing this close to each other. Yeah. And being able to just shit react quite quickly from the yeah. middle is quite... Yeah, all the time, I think that's the thing about the medium guard. Like, I don't, it's not a bad guard, it's actually a really good guard because it is, it's like 80%, 80 to 90% as good as any guard, other guard at most things. But like the outside guard, you know, we can't thrust from here very easily at all. And if I'm here, I'm probably going to throw to the inside. The, you know, I can't throw to the outside without really like a preparatory movement. And Hutton generally doesn't really do preparatory movements that much. Um, so yeah, I when I go to the outside guard, I have committed to a position and a series of tactics. In the medium guard, I could do anything, and it's fairly easy for me to do most of those things. So yeah, that's yeah. No, I, I, like, I don't disagree. Um, I just, yeah, it's a, I don't know, I think it's kind of a, a thing where the medium guard is kind of, it's, you know, you're, it's your jack of all trades guard, kind of thing. Um, yeah. Um, conversely, you have the inside guard. Samuel's the outside guard, but just on the inside. <laughs> That's, yeah. Um, so if you're wanting to close off, um, the, if you want to close off the inside line rather than the outside, like if Jacob's in a, I like, like a right shoulder type thing and it's threatening there. I can now close off this line. And I think part of why Hutton likes these because he talks a lot about needing to fence the sorts of opponents that British swordsmen are sorting. And yeah, like a lot of that included people who were doing fighting from withdrawing guards or fighting from their hand back, and in many cases had um, shields. Like you see a lot of sword and buckler all through um, India at the time. Um, so yeah, he, like having just being able to close off the line is kind of useful. Um, the interesting thing about this is, in the old like the um, Angelo system, when particularly as it kind of moved away from, or guards and pairs became slightly separate, it had three core guards, which was its outside guard, inside guard, and hidden guard. Um, and then the first guard to disappear when other people started running, including Hutton, was the inside guard, because if you do the inside guard quite retracted like this. I'll get as far onto the camera as I can. Um, yeah, you can kind of see there's a big, over, there's a good amount, like a bit, oh, my forearm has a large silhouette. Whereas in an outside guard, not so much. So if I lie on an inside guard, if I can actually do that, probably not without the more name, but just, yeah, they can come over really quickly in the forearm, um, which is why it was abandoned. Um, whereas in the outside guard, that's not so much the case. No chance. <laughs> you can do it. It's possible, just really hard. I think you're actually even more likely to get the forearm from the outside. And even it's not very likely. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Um, but yeah, so whereas if I've got an extended guard, you can see how the silhouette of my, of my forearm is not that big. So I've actually found a way to close the inside line, which is just kind of cool. I think that's also another reason why Hutton likes these very extended guards. Um, the next guard he has is the hang guard, which he says you shouldn't lie in because it's really fatiguing, um, but you recover in it. Like, it's a really good guard to recover to. So, if I attack Jacob, regardless of what happens, I want to come back to a hang guard because it makes it easy for me, it keeps me a lot safer than um, like just going back to a medium guard or like even just avoiding wood. That's also what happens if you if you arm all the name and someone's attacking you, you end up kind of there anyway. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's yeah, pretty much. 
project oh. this is the best guard for uh, short people. <laughs> because I can defend just about any attack you throw if I'm squatting. Yes, yeah. now just covers everything above my knees, basically. Yeah, and to go low, particularly to spot bike when we're fighting in a closer engagement range, I, I threw my sword away, which I don't like doing. So yeah, I'm going to probably, yeah. So yeah, good guard for small people. Uh, although Hutton is very specific that you just do not lie in it. Um, and yeah, then he has one other guard that he mentions, which is the resting guard, where I start a medium guard and I just drop my hand and rest it here. And this is what I do when my opponent is out of distance because I want to rest my arm. Um, I don't use this one very often just because I tend to find like my fencing matches are very active. The one time I really do use this, um, not, um, it's not for energy conservation because as a modern humorist, my energy conservation method is to only dart for like two minutes at a time. <laughs> um, <laughs> so yeah, instead, um, but what I do find it really useful for is I'll go to this if my opponent is completely out of measure. Um, like if my opponent is just really moving back, which you can't really do in here. <laughs> you run down the hallway and just, yeah, so I can't, Jacob was like, yeah, ball gone, I'll just go, you know, if Jacob's so far back that there's no way I can even lunge at them, I'm just gonna drop and rest in the resting guard. And that becomes a way of signaling, but that also signals to Jacob that I think Jacob's out of distance. So, so if I think I'm not out of distance, it's also an encouragement to me to do a really massive lunge. I take myself horribly out of position. <laughs> yes. So that one's fun. Um, but yeah, those are your basic guards. I think they're all cool. I think... Well, also, it's a good guard if you're a schmuck like me who doesn't actually want to fight swords with people. So you sit like this and just try to snipe them at weird angles so you don't have to parry them across ever. <laughs> just, yeah, just four up cut everything. <laughs> I mean, that works more than it should, but I... I don't think it's as reliable as no. you want either. <laughs> um, conversely, if you've got someone doing that, uh, if you're in like the resting guard and I'm just in a sense of guard, I can actually extend out and move my hand away. Yeah. So now I've got a lot of reaction time. If you go back to the resting guard, if you take how snap my ricks, I've got time to come around and do things and yeah, just use the fact that your opponent's sort of is traveling in a direction to take advantage and create an opening, which is cool, which is also what Hutton would call timing. Um, he uses the timing as a verb, but also as a noun, and he just says, and you do timing here, that's kind of, the language in this gets kind of interesting, and I think part of that is also that it's translated to 19th century English from French, and so he's trying to keep, his, kind of maintain what would be a very sensible sounding sentence in French but kind of keep as much of that as possible as translating into English so it gets a bit weird. Um, I know, that's my, that's my theory, I'm sticking to it. Um, yeah, anyway, let's move on and look at attacks. So, Hutton starts the attacking section with the Mullinani, which he takes directly from Roworth. Um, he moves away from the, the typical target used in the 19th century uh, design from the, you know, from the Angelo school and re-adopts um, Roworth's target, which only has Six cuts. Um, I know if you've done more than with me, you'd be like, but there's seven cuts. And yeah, that, that's not something Hutton does. That's probably cutting is like the least Huttony thing I do. And that's, you know, still splitting hairs as to what has influenced my cutting the most, Hutton or um, Alice to win. Um, but um, yeah, he just has six more names. But what he says about them is you don't necessarily flow through from one to another straight away. You start by just doing one, so cutting, and cut one, and you do that as a way of um, building up strength, or he says of suppling the wrist, so building up strength and my building the wrist. Um, the cuts are still the typical 19th century cuts, so one, two, three, four, five, six, that's it. I keep, I almost reflexively did seven, but no, he, does, he doesn't have the seventh cut because Roworth didn't believe, in, didn't believe cut seven was real. Um, but yeah, that's a beginning exercise and gives you a target. Um, and yeah, you just do them in big circles, big circles, and you can transfer between them. And he's actually a lot more versatile with it than I tend to be in my lessons because I'm slack and you know, <laughs> probably should do more bullying, warm up and stuff. Although I, I find that actually as an exercise, 
it's a really good thing to do at home when you're like working from home and you're just like, oh, I need to fidget with something or I just need to get up and move around. You have been doing some more days, it's quite nice. But I find in classes there are high quality things I can be doing. So Yeah, well, when you bother to get a whole bunch of people together, you might as well do things that you can't do alone. Yeah, exactly. that, that, that's a big part of my teaching philosophy as well. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, he then leads into the cuts, which brings us to the first bit of interesting with this, which is how does Hutton cut? Because all he says is you extend and cut down the line and cut down um, or come along and come along cut one of them all the name. Um, but the, you know, the language of it is weird is, you know, the question of, is he expecting you to just do this? Where he says extend, cut, and that's it? Or is he expecting you to do this, where you come all the way around? Um, and this is a bit of a debate. There is also an interpretation that says what Hartman is actually saying to do is you do a full prefe um, like prefacing wall and A and then hit. Uh, but that I'm very convinced that that is not what he's saying to do because there's a whole bunch of these drills that just don't work if you do it that way. Um, like that's just completely consistent with the stuff in the rest of the text. Whereas doing this where you come all the way around might not be. Um, and doing and just cutting like the amount along the line of the Mornay um, is, you know, works really, really well with all of the drills. Um, it's also, you know, when Cutton says the Mornay, he is referring specifically to the target you put up on the wall. He's not necessarily referring to the Mornay as a technique. But again, Hutton has some really weird phrasings um, <laughs> in the manual, so who knows. Um, and I mailed over this a lot. Um, I looked at other people's interpretations and the people who are any of the people who are doing cut who are quite good didn't really seem to have a definite stance on this. And I came to the official conclusion, it does not freaking matter. This is not a literal drill. This is not you literally cutting is literally exactly this or exactly this um, and nothing else. This is these are things you do to just learn how to throw cuts well. You practice your more names. You then, we then practice either against the dummy target if you want to work on strength, on power generation, and with a training partner um, if you want to work on like your blade angle and things like and things like that. Please don't hit your training partners very hard. Um, <laughs> yeah, um, but yeah, um, they don't. Um, it doesn't actually matter. These are not literal drills that are designed to teach you a very specific literal technique. These emotions you go through because when you when you get good at doing these motions and you have the mobility and the strength to do them well, when you go out and fence, you will throw good cuts. Um, the other thing as well to make this more complicated is Hutton says always recover to um, the hangout. So he says the hangout is the best card to recover to, and the whole following the whole line of the Mornay is very consistent with extend, cut, hang guard because I bring my blade in full circle, and that's a really rad cool thing to do. But he doesn't bother to say what to do if you decide to recover to a medium guard, like I often do, um, because frankly, he expects you to have the knowledge to work that out yourself. Um, also, there's a there's a practical concern of just like a heavier sword, a more tired arm, you're more likely to move an through all your cuts anyway. Yeah. So it's like it's better to learn to do both. Yeah. Like, if you train it as just one, and then your arm gets tired. To, uh, Mm. Oh, fuck. <laughs> yeah, actually, that's the other thing as well is if you're in like an outside guard, you know, you do throw a full ball an A, and there's some suggest, you know, it's also possible that the way Hutton's describing it is he's describing how you cut from the majority of his guards to so an inside guard. I do throw a full ball an A to come all the way back to guard. Um, even with a hanging guard, you throw a full ball an A to come back to guard. It's just the medium guard. Where that's not where the more intuitive and useful thing to do is to only go along the line of the target rather than going full head. Mm. Um, and if we look at consistency of the text, the most consistent reading, methodological reading of Hartman would be just work it out for yourself. Well, it, it, it could be the assumption that because there's no medium parry, it's only a guard. The assumption could be you might start a fight from medium guard, you make an attack, and then the assumption is that they're always going to attack back, so you'd never return straight to medium. Yeah. You're always going to go through hanging, then realize you're safe and go, okay, back to medium. Yeah, but that that is highly likely as well. Um, Which I guess we'll get 
add credence to the idea that almost all cuts should come out through a mini main. Yeah. Well, because yeah, I mean, even with like quite a really light saber, that is the most efficient way to move it, just because as much as Hutton advocated for a lighter saber than would have in Britain time, we're talking about like a weight difference, you know, if you get a sense of the difference. This is, well, this was originally a uh, Hanway Hutton saber, but with a, I've got a Castile hilt that makes it a little heavier and brings the balance down and makes it um, absolutely gorgeous. Um, and this one survived like 15, more than 15 years of fencing, so it's pretty robust. This weighs about 650 grams. This is a Regnier Strong Saber. It weighs something like a bit over, uh, a bit over 900 grams, so it is noticeably heavier. Um, this sword is very t is actually probably quite accurate to what Hutton was recommending. Uh, he was not re recommending using the sorts of sabers used in modern fencing. He was recommending using a saber with you know, a degree of weight just lighter than what was in vogue in Britain at the time. This is pretty representative of what was in vogue in Britain at the time. You know, a saber that weighs the same as like a full weight cavalry saber. Um, and yeah, with this thing, you do end up mourning quite a bit. So yeah, reasonable assertion. Um, yeah, so the assumption then could well be then that um, yeah, you will mullinay out of everything because everyone's used to using heavier swords anyway. Yeah. Um, I would disagree with that. Just Hutton is very much working off the assumption that fencing is kind of neglected in Britain because uh, in his time it was. Like people are still practicing it, but he's like, yeah, um, he's like, yeah, they. Um, he's writing a definitive manual to really define what saber is, and he's writing for an audience, an audience that may not, that probably isn't that familiar with saber, especially because um, at the time, one of the, like, at the time, say uh, or broadsword fencing, saber fencing in Britain was almost considered a separate, like a separate um, art form for foil fencing. And I mean, when they say fencing in the period, usually what they mean is foil fencing. Right? Um, if they want to talk about like saber, they'll say either saber or broadsword. Um, so yeah, I think um, yeah, he's not he's not making any, he's assuming that the reader hasn't done any um, saber, um, but has done all like you know he's not familiar with saber at all, but is familiar with foil. Um, but yeah, he does think that a lighter sword, um, you know, is a better training tool than um, a full weight one. Mostly because it's easy to maneuver, so it's easy to learn the technique. Um, he actually does argue that it's more accessible. Like you, you don't have to be as strong to pick up, you know, as strong to just start fencing. Um, and he also just says, like, you can fence for a lot longer with it, so you can do get more reps in. Um, yeah. So I know it's, Hutton then goes on to talk about cuts, um, specifically of which he has eight. <laughs> so. Um, he has just this pace is gonna get weird. Um, yeah, so cut one is from right to left, cut two, left to right, cut three, rising from right to left, cut four, rising from left to right, cut five, horizontal from right to left, cut six, horizontal from left to right, cut seven, which is a vertical cut, which he says is not he says is a only occasionally useful, and then there is cut eight, which is a rising cut. Vertically. Uh, Hutton, um, Hutton doesn't mention cut eight very much in the rest of Cold Steel. Most of what he says about it, he says one, it's the one cut he's got from Italians, from the Italians, whereas his cutting is all otherwise derived entirely from the Angelo school and from Woolworth. Um, and he says the problem with it is that the primary target for it is the fork of the leg, um, so the groin, it's a groin shot, which he says is inappropriate for school play. Um, he does at one point though say you can use it to target the arm to object with some guard. I can use this to target the arm. Although personally I don't ever use it. Um, so I'm going to target the arm with a rising cut. I tend to want to do a false hitch cut because I find that they're quicker and more deceptive. Mm -hmm. um, well also coming at an angle actually helps you get around the shell anyway. Yeah. Like I'm more likely to get it here than I am here. Yeah. Yeah, fair. Um, but is it, yeah, so it's not, it's, as much as there's this idea that Hutton is doing essentially bastardized Italian fencing, in his court, like, his guards have no Italian influence, his cuts have 
one out of eight Italian influence, and the rest is all still very much directly taken from the Angelo school tradition. Um, and failing that from backsorting, but from backsorting manual, he says the Hutton says is just representative of Henry Angelo, the elder's broadsword system. So, yeah. Um, but yeah, he then has thrusts. So he says with thrusts, which he kind of expects you know how to do point work and thrusts from good foil. So he just says which ones to use. He says um, basically use tears if you're engaged on the inside, if you're engaged on the outside. So Jake and I are engaged. You can see that my blade is in front. I want to use tears because that points my blade um, on my edge at Jacob's sword. So I can just place it more effectively. And if we're engaged on the inside, um, I want to use cart because again I want my blade to be pointing at um, Jacob's sword because that helps displace it. And yeah, that's his only advice. He doesn't really go very into the mechanics of thrusts because he always expects you to know how to thrust. Uh, same is true of blade work, like with a disengage. He just says that you should already know how to do it. Um, or he just says what it is and when to do it. He doesn't really go into a lot of detail on how um, because he expects you to know how to disengage from foil fencing. Um, same with um, what he calls a cutover. Um, where you just basically lift your sword over. Uh, although what he'll say um, is that disengage is a better for thrust, so if I'm going to thrust Jacob, um, disengage is a thrust, whereas if I want to cut Jacob, I want to use a cut over. Um, which is also an interesting point where people, uh, when people ask about French influences of Hutton. In French saber from the period, um, you know, this is all one cut, uh, whereas Hutton would see that as two motions. You would see that as a cut over and an attack. Um, so yeah, when, this is also why I don't think it, or one of the many reasons why Hutton's not doing Moulinet, full Moulinets before he's um, launching his attacks, because any preparatory motion that Hutton does, or anything that Hutton does before the direct cut, he would consider a separate action. Um, yeah, and then you almost would need to teach cut overs, because any cut with a preparatory Moulinet would cut over essentially. Yeah, exactly. He, so he would mention them separately. Um, yeah, so he then uh, attack wise, he talks about the principle of opposition when he just says what it is, and it's not in any context where there's this context where you're like, wait, what does this apply to? And then you kind of try and work that out and you realize that it applies to pretty much everything. So he's just describing a principle in the same way that he would talk. He talks about principles of distance. Um, weirdly enough, Hutton doesn't bother talking about measure until quite late in the manual, whereas opposition is quite early on, like it's in the attack section where it's most relevant. So I would suggest that opposition is a much more um, is a much more important principle to Hutton than um, than um, distance is, which I think is kind of interesting. But yeah, opposition is just covering yourself. So if I want to check Jacob, um, look, this side just is going to be a bit easy to see. If I extend my hand out and I don't cover myself, Jacob can yeah, just boot me. If I extend my hand out and I use my shoulder to cover myself, Jacob cannot boot me, but I can boot Jacob. So, yeah. Um, the explaining, understanding what it is is very easy. Explaining, understanding how to do it is more difficult. But experimenting with it and going, all right, how do I apply this? Um, is a really, really rad way to get you to think about blade work. And this stuff for Hutton is obviously using what we call um, scaffolding or zones of proximal development in modern education theory, even though that wasn't a theory when he was alive. Like, we don't get that theory until like the 1920s. But he kind of leaves these gaps of explanation um, to help you, so where you just have to kind of work stuff out yourself. But the working your stuff out yourself is actually really, really good learning. Um, like now teachers will deliberately say, right, you've got to give you a bit of information and a goal, but they won't give you the full thing, so you have to work some of it out. Um, with opposition, I'm not convinced that's what's happening. I think he just put it in there. At, he put it in there because he knew it was important, but didn't really know where else to put it. But it still it works. Like just being like, "What is this? How do I? Do, okay, how does this apply?" Like asking reactively asking, "How does this apply?" Does actually teach you how to do opposition. So I'm. I don't know. I I think it's a. It's a net gain, but it might have been a gain by accident. I don't know. Um, yeah, the other the other two things Hutton has as a tax is a pommel strike. So if Jacob basically comes in and does like the um, cinematic, like you know, 
really close, you know, the, um, like come, like the arrow fling, you know, we're pushing into it. Like close That's up. dramatic, no? Yeah. Yeah. What well, Hutton says is what you can do is punch the sword to one side and then hit, and then hit the person with the pommel. He says it's mostly something that soldiers should know from practical combat. It's not polite in school play. But he's like, you know, you can do it if there's someone who's just rushing in and trying to basically crash into you. Um, as a way of teaching them a lesson, um, which, okay. Um, he says you can, there's command, what he calls commanding, which is if we're on guard and they can, like, we just end up at any sort of where around here where I can reach out and grab a sword. You just reach out and grab a sword and he doesn't actually tell you, he doesn't, he tells you enough that the one time, the one way he explains how to do it in detail is obviously not what he means when he's just explaining how it's generally used. But I think, again, this, there's a lot of British manuals that just say, and now you just reach out and grab, and they don't bother telling you how. Again, so I think they just assume you, you know how to grab things. Um, the one, and this is, the one grapple he does describe in Cold Steel, which is arsy as heck, is Jacob and I have come in, so we've crushed, we're here. What I do is I reach up with my hand, I grab my own sword by the um, forte, I reach over and grab Jacob's sword, I pivot outwards and come to this position. And then stab. And yeah, I, it's arsy as hell. And Hunt, but Hunt does explicitly say, if someone's rushing in on you and you can do it, do this and they will not rush in on you ever again. <laughs> Which, I mean, yes, if someone did that to me, if I was rushing aggressively to clinch or slam, clinch or slam people and someone did that to me, I would not clinch or slam them after that. But also, it, good luck bleed it off though. Like, there's a bunch of advice in here that just kind of relies on you being really, really good. It's like, um, you know, you see like um, the roll and thunder kick in um, mixed martial arts, where someone basically does a forward roll and kicks their opponent with kicks their opponent with the trailing leg, and that's hard enough to do. And then to pull it off, you have to be really, really good. It's like there's a bit of stuff like that where you just even a very skilled fencer is just not going to have the skill to do that. Something's advice. Have you tried being a better fencer? <laughs> Get to God's trouble. <laughs> oh, good. yeah. Ah, speaking of getting better, let's move on to the defenses. So Hutton has so Hutton's primary defense or exclusive uh, actually primary defense. He does have counter cuts and counter thrusts. Uh, parries, and he says that parries and guards are different things. Uh, he says. He says in other manuals there are two types of parries, and this is consistent with other forms of the time. There are simple parries and parries by opposition. Um, of which Hutton says you will primarily do simple parries in Sabre. A simple parry is percussive, like you aggressively punch to opposition, and a lot of Hutton's parries are very, very tight. Um, basically, I think to stop this from being an overcommitted and dumb motion, if I very quickly punch to a cart guard, and it turns out to be fake, I can very quickly punch to a tear scar just to be safe. Whereas if I'm doing a much wider, more aggressive um, kind of punch, like I'm really trying to beat the thing away, I'll tell you this is what Parise does, although, again, not expert on Italian, so if I'm wrong about Parise, just make a response video and let's get some, let's just get some YouTube drama going. <laughs> um, but yeah, so Hutton doesn't want big commit motions. He wants short, quite punchy motions that can be recovered from uh, quite easily. And he says to do this because it displaces the saber better and it also creates a bit of an opening. Uh, he says you can also parry by opposition. So it's not simple and complex parries, it's simple parries and parries by opposition. Um, you can tell this was a very organic kind of uh, name and terminology. Uh, so a parry by opposition is if my opponent throws a cut at me, I just create a line for them to come down so that they're going to end up in my forte and I'm going to end up in the position where Repost. Um, what I find when I'm fencing with this, um, and this is just me, your mind may vary, when I'm fencing with steel, I really um, I tend to prefer parries by position um, because I find that that just that the subtlety of it gives me more of an opening than um, beating. Whereas when I'm fencing with offers, which you know, these are the beginning weapons and also hot weather weapons. <laughs> Because when it gets beyond 25 degrees, maybe up to close to 30, I don't want to put on a full kit for steel. I actually find that I tend to prefer simple parries 
um, because the bounds of the buffers make them exponentially more effective, but also um, but also makes them um, also just kind of work a lot better. Also, with the bounciness of the buffers, if you try to parry just by opposition, they might end up bouncing anyway, and you can end up getting hit, which is always very frustrating. Yeah, because you do a perfectly good parry, and then it just kind of bounces over. And yeah, <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, well, I, do, I actually think that is significant because Hutton's, Hutton says that his method is a method for Sabre and also single stick. So it's not clear whether you'd be trained practicing with one of these or with a single stick. Uh, I have some ones somewhere, but I, it's on the back of my weapon rack and I can't be bothered getting it. Um, but yeah, it's just a stick with a, a little basket belt that does bounce when you parry. Uh, some good questions, so I might pause for that just because I've been talking for a lot. Um, and Mick wants to know, do you think short punching motions are tighter and leave less openings and maybe stronger? Um, I don't think, I mean, I think the tightness is something you very much have to work on. Your parry should always end up in the same position. So the position you want to go to for a parry bar position is the same position you want to go to for a single parry. But I do think they're a lot stronger. Um, and I do think they're a lot, I do think they're a lot stronger. Um, just in general, like if your opponent is coming with a very heavy card, whacking their cut back is actually a very good thing to do. And this is like if you're fencing a very, very large person with a very large sword, like if you have like cross batting against long sword or something, definitely like pack simple parry is much, much better. Um, just because they're stronger. And potentially a disagreement, which is that if I have the, at least in Sabre, I don't know how this, I don't think this would apply to any kind of two handed weapon. At least in Sabre, if I have the bigger, heavier Sabre, I would rather you do quite the second parries because then you're starting my mini man for me. Yeah. Whereas if I just slide down to a hit, I have to put a lot of my effort into starting my mini man. Okay, interesting. Whereas yeah. if I've got a lighter Sabre, then you're getting knocked aside is much more of a problem. Because, mm. yeah, you're disrupting the flight. Mm. Um, yeah, no fair. Um, yeah, I guess it's kind of. I guess my thinking is more if you've got a really heavy saber. Well, if I danger of me to see it. Yeah, kind of for <laughs> Yeah, if there's a danger of that, the cost of is better. Yeah. Um, incidentally, it's, something that's really interesting is uh, the one modern criticism I see of Hutton that actually appears historically. And obviously, like, as much as there's a lot of criticism of Cold Steel now, there wasn't a lot of it in the period. Most people um, regard it quite positively. But there was. There's one source I found. I've not found the original source, but I have found I found enough sources to quote it to kind of have a rough idea of what the source is saying. And it's from a book called Swords and How to Use Them by Mr. Noix, who was um, someone involved in the Eldershot, um, like the Royal British Military Academy of Gymnastics at Eldershot. And what he says is that um, Hutton, well, he says Hutton has too many yards, which that's I guess something we'll discuss later. Uh, but other he says that two, he says that the guard of six is too weak, and also the parry fire time is too slow. Um, but yeah, it sits is here where I'm protecting my outside, parrying with the back of my sword. Jacob loves his parry. It's just Jacob's. <laughs> my thinking has changed about it. Isn't it? Yeah, um, and yeah, like I mean, I don't think it, I don't think it's quite as true that if like you can't stop a really hard blow with this, but I don't think it's definitely not as biomechanically sound. As a TS parry is. It does actually, what I've realized is it does protect you from the inside of your forearms a lot better than TS does. Yeah, fair. It, it, mean, it means the outside of your hand's a little bit more exposed, but you still got some shell there. Yeah. Whereas the inside of your forearm is much harder to hit. Yeah, fair. Um, but yeah, um, one of the things that one of the sources commenting on Mr. Noix's comment says is. Mr. Noack has clearly not actually read the manual because Hutton specifically says that this is all that this is done percussively. And it's actually um, if or just stand, it's fine. Um, if I turn my hand over and rip with this, it's a really lovely, quite percussive beat. And the turning the hand over um, actually make like generates a lot of power impact. Like, um, there are stick fighting systems where they deliberately parry with the back of the hand because they're trying to beat the stick aside to come back in, and it has the same motion. Um, I do a similar thing on the other side with the hand position of Quint. 
Hutton doesn't actually mention the mention Quint as a hand position at all in Cold Steel um, because it's it's not very commonly used. But I think this is rad, and it's basically extrapolation of just using this as essentially a beat. So yeah, I. I guess that kind of answers, hopefully that answers Nick's question, but also, yeah, that's six, and I probably want to raise about six anyway, so that's cool. Um, I should probably mention the Paris Hutton has is Prime, which is defends the high inside, Second, which defends the, actually, oh, sorry, yes. Second, which defends the outside from kind of the shoulder down, or, and then he has Low Second, which defends the leg, Low Prime, which defends the low inside, uh, he then has Tears, which defends um, the high outside. High Tears, which defends the high outside and also for vertical cuts to the head. Low Tears, which defends basically um, any cut from sort of mid thigh, mid thigh to hip. Um, then has Cart, which defends the high inside. High Cart, uh, which defends the head and like in particular, and also like um, horizontal cuts to the head. And then low cart for defending um, the fork of the legs and more. And chiefly, when Hutton right, um, wrote the swordsman, he basically listed these as one parry that you would vary in height um, because one of the prisms of cold steel was that there were too many parries. So Hutton decided to um, cull the numbers down a bit by just explaining what, say, you can do three things with the one parry. Um, but yeah, which. I think that's a better way to view them than as three distinct actions. Uh, so he then has. The yeah, I would, I would simplify even further. What? I would go leg up parries on your outside, leg up parries on your inside, leg down parries on your outside, leg down parries on your inside. <laughs> yeah. The problem with that is it no longer complies with the um, French hand position, so a foil fencer will find it less intuitive. Mm. Um, he then has the head guard of St. George. Which is used exclusively for defending against cut seven, uh, which I find it's actually I find it's occasionally useful for me against any time my opponent is in some kind of high guard that's very hard to do in anywhere with a low ceiling. And it's useful for everything for me because everything goes in my head. Yeah, I just don't mean guard. So if I attack Jacob, um, yeah, with a seven, cut two. One. Yeah, if you're shorter than your opponent, it's rad. Especially if you make sure by spotting. Yeah, as you do it. It's just why you have to be a lot shorter. Like, I'm very tall, Jacob is less than average height. You don't have to be a lot shorter, you just have to be a lot squattier. <laughs> True, if you, you squat very well. Yes, you can, but that's just making yourself short. <laughs> it's like an artificial shortener. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so. That's fun with that in my tea. <laughs> There's then the Paria 6, which we just covered, which is, um, yeah, we just covered it. It's a rad parry. It's kind of a good oh shit parry as well. Like if you're in cart and you realize that something's actually faked, doing that can be quite good. Uh, it has the disadvantage though, is if your opponent is shorter than you, if I parry 6, my hand is still kind of exposed, and I can slip in. Whereas if you parry 6, it's actually. I can't get there because the shell is in the way. So if you're tall, if you're much taller than your opponent, it is a riskier parry. The other thing I noticed with six is if you plan to return after parrying six with a direct attack, it's actually slightly faster than two. But if you plan to move an A, it's a lot more awkward. Yeah. Like moving an A out of this hand position is quite weird. Like, if I fall over, well, then I just pushed your sword into my own forearm. Yeah, yeah, I think it makes sense that it came from like a, a lighter sort of tradition because then you're less likely to want to more than A anyway. Yeah. If it comes from foil than. Yeah, in foil. For no reason you want more than A in foil. Yeah. No. Well, in foil, actually, this uh, one of the things that happen that ha uh, happened just at the start of all the 1880s in Britain, uh, it wasn't Hutton that did this, it was uh, the French fencing masters in Britain, like Provost, um, who kind of led this change. but. They went from using cart and uh, cart and tears and backwards um, as primary parries to six and cart as primary parries, um, which I think is also kind of why Hutton includes it. It's a very very prominent um, foil parry. So he does include it in the swordsman, 
um, probably because, um, possibly also because it was criticised by someone from Eldershot who Hutton kind of leaned on side if he wanted his method to become a standard British military method, mm -hmm. which really didn't work out for him because they'd already decided to go with Masiello, um, even but like at about you know around the same same time that Cold Steel was published. Um, so his his works, were, as far as I know, his works his sword works were never actually considered for military service. Like people call it um, British military saber, and it is true. Hutton did teach various regiments, and his uh, Cold Steel and Swordsman were used in specific regiment offensive schools. Like this was taught to the military, and also Hutton was a former military sword instructor, although well before he wrote Cold Steel. Um, but it was never a standard method, and this is my point. And also. Calling it military, British military saber, I find frustrating because most of the sources we use for it, like Hutton and also Wade, were civilian, were civilian fencing, like were from the civilian fencing community, or you know, from the fencing community, not from the military. Um, but yeah, so after that, you also have Septim, which is the parry. He almost exclusively uses to protect the legs. Um, you can, in theory, do it high, but I don't think he ever does. I might be wrong about that, there might be some reference, but it's yeah. pretty rare. Once again, if you get caught halfway from a Mormon A, you're essentially doing a high set thing. Yeah, but Hutton only uses Mormon A's recovery, so like the Mormon A thing is more a thing that, it, like it's more, it's much more a French thing. Mm. Um, so yeah, it's, I mean, if it's you're wanting to bring in elements of French saber, it's really, really cool to do um, high, but yeah, it's um, when you're not when you're not cutting in that method, you're not using more cut like more ways um, as a prefacing that action for cuts. Not a thing. But not even if you, it doesn't have to be prefacing. Like if I do a direct cut here, you carry it and I'm trying to recover. Uh, no, not like that. I'm going to do something like this and I'm trying to recover. Yeah. I could go in through a high set team essentially. No, because high set is on the other side. You just did high charge. Well, then that one then. <laughs> yeah. No, this, see that? Like, it is really awkward if you're not more than. Um, yeah, and then there's the other one, which uh, is was a controversial in the day, but is and it's still probably the most controversial pack now. Hayatar. Um in the period, the, the well, the one critic, I, I shouldn't say critics, because should, there's only one of them, um, said it was too slow, which you know, not really. Um, Hutton does say that this is a parry he's gotten from Italian fencing, um, and he says basically he includes it because. There is one time when it's the only parry you can do. So if Jacob throws a cart at my own side, I parry. I can very quickly roll around like that and boot Jacob in the face. And what Hutton says, and I don't, there's a lot of people who disagree with that, but obviously this, what Hutton says is that Hayat Khan is the only parry you can use in that situation. And that's the only time he actually recommends it. Um, it's a, when newspaper articles reacting to Noah says, well, would Mr. Noah rather you just not parry at all? Um, and yes, there are, I'm sure there's a lot of you out there will be able to think of other things you could do in that situation, and that is very fair, but Hutton's solution is high tar. And this is the only time he actually uses it. It's not a core parry, which is kind of a problem with cold steel. Hutton just lists a bunch of techniques, lists a bunch of drills so that you can learn how to do them, and then he has tactical advice, sometimes in dispersed throughout and sometimes, and but mostly at the end. Um, Whereas you compare that to the swordsman, where he's much more sequential, where he's like, you know, where he lists core parries and auxiliary parries. Um, his core parries, incidentally, are cart, tears, set team, and second. Um, and then all of his other parries are auxiliary parries, except for six, which he doesn't mention the swordsman at all. Um, but yeah, he, there's, I like, this is a legitimate thing of frustration with Hutton. He does tell you what to do with things, but he doesn't. He introduces them and then tells you what to do with them later. And this is the what. This is why when you're using Hutton as a reference source, where you're just like looking for a specific drill or a specific skill, you kind of have to look for it in multiple places. And the manual is otherwise really good for that, but because uh, it's got all the things you need, it's got a really good description, a nice picture, um, and then it's got a and then. Um, it's got like some advice and tactical advice on how to use it, but just it's all in the same place. So we've got some comments. So we've got cool. So several fences says 
Hot tub is used when it's really necessary. It's fine, but people use it way too much when not uh, not needed and get hit in the arm or the outside, uh, the inside or the head on the outside. Um, and he says uh, for Saber IT, IT is out of habit. Oh, sorry, he said um, it's a big weakness of many mess offenses. Oh, cool. So that's cool. okay. So yeah, train high octave in your fencing clubs so that you can deal with mess offenses more effectively. No, I think um, he's saying mess offences do it too often. Yeah, I know that's what he is saying that, but also um, because you can cross train. <laughs> yeah, but <laughs> this is like because if you say it's a bad habit of system X, if you're not doing system X, it's a thing you should deliberately train to take advantage of so you can beat system X. <laughs> um, and then yeah, the final comment is for Saber, I um, I teach them out of habit. Yeah, that, that's fine. I think. Um, I mean. It's not as good, it's not a really good parry if your opponent is throwing an opening attack. Um, it's not as weak, I think it's not as weak as people think. Um, in a, if you are going to use it against an opening rather than as an ship, As an ship parry, it's decent because in any position where um, it's an ship parry, your opponent's not really going to be able to get the weakness in play. If you don't, um, especially, like, I hear a lot of people say, oh, but they can press on the flat. Or they can press on the foible. The foible is like over there. Yeah, like if my opponent has this sword over there, I'm just going to ignore it and hit them because it's not really me. Um, but when you're doing it as when you're transitioning to it against um, a direct attack, like that's not a repost, um, yeah, like I have to go through a position where Jacob could just drop this sword. Um, don't, don't, you don't have to cut over it, just about here, like halfway through, I am very vulnerable to that. Um, what I find works really well, if I really, really am determined to use high, high octave, because I don't want to use any of the other parries that I outside the cut has, uh, what I can do is we just do the cut. I start, I move to octave like a foil, so my tip is really forward. And then once I've got contact with the forte, with the forte, then I ride up the blade to then power my repost. So I'll just show that again very slowly. Jacob does the attack. I'm making contact, my blade is still forward, if you can see that. Um, my blade is still forward, so Jacob, so I've still got a decent amount of strength. Uh, it's just like doing this, like, uh, whatever this motion of weights is, I don't know, I see it at the gym a lot. And then once I have contact, then I roll around, because that way I'm protecting the weak of my blade, uh, like, or protecting the, I should say, weak, the, um, the midst and the fly ball. And that's what powers my attack. Whereas if I mistime it, like if I just go to here, Jacob can just drop the hand blast through. So there's a bit of a, you can do it with a bit of a timing component, but also it's RC and it requires, again, there are plenty of times where Hutton just relies on you already having really good timing because you're an experienced fencer. Um, and I would also suggest that, also suggest that that usage will only work if you're taller than your opponent. Yeah. So if you do that again, so far there's a parry here. Yeah. If I'm taller than you, you're still in danger. Because if your hand is this low and your opponent's taller than you, your shoulder is still in a lot of danger. Yeah. It's more, I mean, it's about, I mean, you're going to vary the timing when you lift your hand. Like, if you did it, you want to lift your hand really quickly, but keep your blade forward until you've definitely, you definitely got contact. So if I make contact all the way down here, I will try. Or if I do decide, or if I do, you know, if I'm one of those people who really likes the bind and it's kind of slow speed pressure games, and I do decide to push down, I now I'm not like, can you just spread? <laughs> yeah, I now know where you take it. Um, and then once you've got that contact, that's when you bring, you start bringing you more, you more, 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 Yeah. Um, yeah. It is a thing you can do. There's a bit of refinement to it. I do think it's kind of counterintuitive. Like, it took me a while to get the hang of this. But yeah, I still only mostly use it as an ocean parry. Um, I think it's by far more intuitive after a repost. Yeah. Oh, it's oh, after, but yeah. Yeah. It is, yeah, that's really the only the only time I would ever really realistically use it is after having a phone and going, oh shit, the swords come get me. Yeah. Yeah, which is when Hutton says to use it. Um so yeah, that's again, I don't think like I don't think it's a bad part. I actually um I used to have a guy I trained with who I told him that it was a, um, like I told him it was an auxiliary and sometimes parry and he decided that his whole style was just going to be to do 
the most obscure parries you can in order to um, like in order to basically be as confusing as possible defense. And so he made it his primary parry, but he got it to work mostly out of just insane athleticism. Like I couldn't replicate the way he did it because for me, I like my timing wasn't good enough. And whereas he was like, you know, a lot faster than most of us and just massively stronger as well. So even if you got proper leverage on him, it didn't help near as much. So yes, if you're an athlete, you, it's also a very really good parry if you're like um, a bazillion times more athletic than your opponents, because then you can get away with a lot of bizarre I stuff. I think anything is a good carry if you're, that, if you're much more athletic than your opponent. Yeah, well, maybe not anything, but definitely like there's a lot of really arsy stuff. It's like the um, the vault, like the commanding thing, we change hands. It's like, yes, if you're a much better fencer and super athletic, you can do that. Most people can't, and honestly, most people shouldn't try. And again, this is a this is actually a problem in what in the modern human community where there's a lot of people who are going to cold steel who think they should be able to do this stuff because they don't have the context of either being really athletic or being athletic enough from having done a combat sport for a few years where they can go yeah that's only going to work from super athletic um, so yeah like it's not well I'm not going to say everything happens is perfect there are times when I really wish he would actually contextualize a bit more but yeah it's Here's the thing. That's so, when I'm critiquing other manuals. <laughs> yeah, well, that's, that's a previous video. <laughs> right. Another cool. comment. Uh, so, yeah. Oh, another comment. I agree. The problem is that in Mesa, there is a misinterpretation of always keeping the point forward, which leads to a weak forward and then getting hit in the head uh, with the point offline. With the point offline, it's safe. Um, yeah, no, that's, yeah, yeah. legit. Um, this is always going to be riskier. Yeah, like, sure. if I can get to here, yeah. like if I get to here, yeah, I'm in trouble. Whereas, yeah, if it's over there. Then you get my weak, you have to go out of the fight, essentially. <laughs> yeah, yeah, no, exactly. That is, yeah, fuck. That is super cool. All right. I, this is awesome commentary because I'm totally going to use that. I'm just going to basically see if I can invoke something for the high outside and then see if I can nail a nice mess of fencer with it. <laughs> That'd be cool. Um, yeah, so. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Um, yeah, so from here, Hutton goes on to provide um, uh, advanced lessons. Oh no, shit, here's one more parry that I almost forgot. Uh, he calls it the low guard. It is the parry against cut number eight. So if Jacob makes a vertical cut at my groin, I do that. Basically, it's a St. George guard, but down. I, yeah. I don't like it. I think it's redundant. Um, I like. I think I do think it is redundant in that if you did that same cut, I came to parry set team. Well, and also now you're a lot safer because if you were back to the to low, low guard, your legs are actually still in danger. Like I can continue forward. Yeah. Here. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely safe. <laughs> yeah. It's, yeah, he's got this weird kind of match cut to match parry to cut thing. Um, but then has to then turn around and be like, oh, but you can use multiple parries for the same cut. Um, like, you know, for number seven, you've got St. George, high tears, and high cut. And then obviously, like, it makes a bit more sense with, say, yeah. He doesn't say that you can do a high octave, but I guess theoretically you can. Well, actually, that, the way you did it would be high set T, because if your hand is on your inside, it's it's um, set team, hand is on your outside, it's not half. Um, but yeah, in theory. Um, George. Yeah. Um, the other thing which I forgot to mention when we um, was with uh, the parries to cut three, Hutton was actually very specific about which you should do for which guard. So if Jacob throws a cut three, if I'm in a medium guard, cut three, so I can do, if I'm in a medium guard, I do set team, which is why it's one of Hutton's primary parries. If I'm in an outside guard, I do low prime. Mm. Um, and the reason for this is really cool. If you throw it, that Moulinet is really beaty, and you see how I've knocked Jacob up, which creates a nice big opening. Um, whereas, but I can't really do that. It's a bit more committed, but also doing it from the medium guard is a bit awkward and doesn't get the beat. It's also just slower. Yeah. There's more of an opportunity to get your hand halfway through it. Yeah. 
whereas this is really quite quick from medium. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, so whereas like just mulling and it's sometimes rad. Um, and this is a thing that I've been playing with a bit as well, particularly from this card, is especially you know, is if especially if I let it drift a little wide, you just kind oh look at that big open inside. Yeah. <laughs> I'm noticing this. Up on this. Yeah. You can just kind of mulinate it in most things. And also if you do like a like a cut of my head. I can just mulinate and come around with a little quicker boss. And that's really fun. Um, and that's also something you only really get from doing the advanced drills, which is Hutton has a bunch of advanced drills where are basically just sequences of reposts. Um, we're not going to go through all of them because we'd be here all day. Um, but basically, the important thing about them is the pedagogy. So, if what Jacob would, you know, so um, you have a master and pupil. Uh, although, what I find really interesting about this is at the end of each sequence, who is the master and who is the pupil reverses, which. Because Hutton is a switch. Because we're sexualizing Hutton now. So, <laughs> that's the thing we're doing. No. Um, so I just, yeah, I just find that really fascinating from like a 19th century perspective, because the idea that you would just reverse who is the coach, like who is coaching and who is learning is kind of a bit, is a bit avant-garde today. Like there's a lot, I've seen a lot of like in schools where they're just like, no, but the beginner just doesn't know enough to coach. And it's only really in, you know, weird progressive schools like the old solar club or Fitzroy College of Arms. See you, Mosh, um, <laughs> where that's a thing that you do. Um, but in the 19th century, yeah, like the idea that all of a sudden you change your roles probably was a bit weird. I think, but I think what Hutton is, Hutton is recognizing that most British fans at the time are amateurs who are just mucking around. So the difference between the person doing the fencing lessons and the person taking the fencing lessons is probably not that much. And there's a lot of them who are going to be learning directly from this book. Um, it also just lets people learn well from teaching. Yeah, I don't think, I know that is a thing. It's probably not something who's consciously. Yeah, involved, that's yeah. not something that people consciously do. Um, of course, we've got some comments, we're just going to get a bit off topic because we haven't done that whole session. Uh, but Sebel Fechter has said, uh, some of Fetzers also use it too much when getting attacked on the upper line instead of outside by raising directly into high Tav, um, leaving their arm open. Oh, yes, yeah, so let's actually. So, yeah, if I'm overusing it, like if. Yeah, so if I'm yeah. overusing it, which means I'm high outside. He said it's actually. That's a tight. Yeah, and tacked to the high, tub inside instead of outside. Oh, okay, yeah, so they're yeah. doing like it's almost like a set team. It leaves your inside arm open. Yeah. Well, if you. I would say it leaves the outside arm open. Because if you do it and you're sliding too narrow. Mm. Yeah. Well, no, you do it, so you do it as a, like a one-two faint. So you faint, and then they come to here, and you nail me, because... Yeah, so I, it's not outside of the arm. Oh, well, so you're coming in on the inside line. Ah, um, yes, yes. Yes. So yeah, but that's rad. I like that. <laughs> that's cool. Um, so he said, going through cart into high octave prevents that. So, yeah. Thank you, the scoop version. Yeah, so just... I go, oh yeah, so I get a, I get a scoop, yeah, just, yeah, or even more, if, you, even more what I can do is I go to here, I can actually come in quite aggressively, mm -hmm. and it stops the faint because I'm covering all of my lines, and I'm through all of them, mm -hmm. so I like that, that is cool. Well, I also are still presenting a point at me, yeah, so like, I, if I start fainting at that point, you just go, oh, okay, yeah, go straight at me, yeah. Is that the cons yeah, that consistent threat? That's cool, yeah. Uh, I like that. Um, cool. I'm very glad we paused for that. Um, yeah, so. It's more. They oh. sidestep the inside. Never mentioned the fake. Oh, never mentioned the fake. Oh, yeah. Uh, that was probably my interpretation. But yeah, no, it's um, they sidestep to the inside. So they're doing that. Yeah, and that's just opening the arm up. Yeah. Um, yeah, interesting. I can see if you're landing it, it being quite effective because now you've stepped through the inside and completely shut off the outside. Yeah. So it's now very easy to like, I don't have to worry about your sword at all until yeah. I choose to do something. Yeah. But if you mistime it, like if I just, ex if I just extended and yeah. you go, I can redirect really easily. Yeah. 
Yeah. I also wonder if, like, um, I could, re I could protect this. Han wouldn't like this, but this is one time where a remise would work. So a remise is where you make two attacks on the same match. So like one, two, that's a remise. Hutton says, this is bad fencing. Like, I can do a redouble where I will go one attack and then move back a bit and renew my attack before I, like, before I come all the way back to guard. But he, you should, Hutton says you should never hang around and with multiple attacks. The only other time, the only time it's permissible to make two attacks on the same lunge is if your opponent backs off. Um, but this is one of those instances where if I throw one and my opponent has stepped wide, if I can get a second attack in, you're very, very vulnerable. Mm -hmm. You're going to a new attack, like using sort of more, using more land recover and uh, renew very quickly. Although if I keep moving, it's going to be quite hard to get that on because I'm consistently shutting off that line. Yeah. Yeah, if you keep I think that's what you do is essentially shut off the outside and then just keep the outside like moving into the here. Yeah, just like it. Yeah. <laughs> so, this one feels like a very grappling move to like yeah. step off front and cover that side so that I can then. Yeah. Well, the Mester as well, which is you know a lot shorter than these, that is much more viable. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah so, next time we do one cutlass. Ooh, yes, that'd be cool. Also try to film it, seeing yeah, a bit of you know a cool things compilation. Um, yeah, so how the advanced lessons? Just sequences of movements. So you know you'll have the you have the master or M and the pupil P, and M basically just throws the same attack at the pupil multiple times, and the pupil parries it the same way but throws different reposts. So you know, I might throw one and then. Um, and then generally, as, and as even more advanced than that, or I think just in general, the um, the ma or the master will parry the repost. So I'll parry, you do your repost. I parry, throw the same cut again. I parry, throw the same cut again. Can't do the same parry. Yeah. Yeah. There is a sequence, but the goal is basically to get people moving from position to position and observing the effects of different ones. We're not, there's an implication that you memorize them. Which neither of us can actually do because we can't the memory of a goldfish collect between the two of us. Far too easy to do for that shit. Yeah. But yeah, the idea is you just get, it actually helps for a little just have someone calling out uh, what you're doing or even have it like, like have it on a whiteboard or something nearby so you can see it and just go through the sequence. Um, and it's not literal. There's no fencing exchange that will, there's just no fencing exchanges ever that happen like that. But it is really good for learning how to move from position to position and really, really good for um, like learning the effects of different reposts. Because you, you know, when you do the one for, say, low prime from the outside guard, that's where you learn like that this is just a really, really brutal beat, um, which is just super cool. So, yeah, it's again, Hutton's kind of pedagogy very much revolves around discovery and he'll tell you to do enough that you'll you kind of learn and observe things for yourself so there is that kind of discovery element to learning um, and I kind of wonder if part of why that's in there when you would expect to see that kind of pedagogy for like another you know almost another 50 years um, is because in Britain there's a lot of people who were working out fencing from vague instruction from someone who didn't who had only really done it for a few years and was teaching because there was no one else or from manuals because Britain had about had like four professional three or four professional fencing instructors outside of the military at the time and even within the military they had trouble having um, schools of arms for each regiment. I uh, certainly Hutton was one of the four professional fencing instructors um, which makes it weird that he was also president of the Amateur Fencing Association um, well, up until it stopped being the Amateur Fencing Association, it just became the British Fencing Association, uh, which is now Fencing Britain, as fate would have it. Um, but yeah, so that's, Hutton has a series of advanced lessons, and if you're looking for co at Cold Steel for reference, as a reference for just a specific thing, read about the technique, maybe skim through just to see if Hutton actually says anything additional about it, and then do the specific drills just to get used to moving in and out of that position. And that's actually a pretty good way to learn Sabre. Um, because again, the goal is not to teach you rote reactions. You're not learning like boxing combos or karate kata. You're just, you're just getting used to moving between positions when you do these, um, which yeah, I think it's kind of cool. 
Um, so, good question. Uh, can you talk about prime versus septime? The process from prime seems significantly more fluid. Um, I mean, yep, sure. So, I mean, the main difference is where you start. So, if I'm here and Jacob throws a cut number three, this septime is a lot quicker. There are some good options from here. I can turn my sword over and hopefully my shell won't get too stuck. Um, and then come straight back and see how I'm keeping contact. I've got contact the entire time. Um, obviously, I can cut. Um, if I need to, or like I do have a few options. Uh, the other thing that you can do is come all the way up for a high cut and actually carry my opponent's sword around to disrupt its return. Um, but in terms of ha like the reason, the primary reason you do it from the medium guard is because it's quick, it's way quicker and less awkward than coming all the way around to a low prime. Um, and also a bit punch, and also it's easy to kind of make this a bit punchy if you want. Which does get this in space. Um, but yeah, the main reason you do it is because of the guard you start in. Conversely, if I'm in an outside guard, I do um, low prime um, because this more than motion is a bit quicker and I thought, well, oh, it's actually not too bad. I just, I don't, uh, you just generally don't do it because you've got the advantage of the percussion. And I can hit and come straight back. Um, I can also hit and turn it all the way around, so I can actually do a lot to disrupt my opponent's sword. Um, the main differences are the starting position. The main differences are like what is convenient from what guard. Um, and also, this is I think is also more common in back sorting, or at least the back sorters say no, that's what they prefer to do. Um, so yeah, they um, so I think that's also a big part of why Hutton says to do it from here but not here. Um, the other thing as well to remember is that in the period, Hutton's one of the few British laws, I think. Also, if I think about French sources, I don't see Septime used that often in French Sabre. Uh, like the 1877 um, parries with essentially low prime, um, although the guard is a bit different. Um, so, yeah, it's sort of, um, although actually in the older Angelo school, the way you would parry is to mirror your opponent's hand position. So you parry, you parry cut one with parry one, cut two with parry two, cut three, cut three with parry three. And cut four with parry four. Well, parry four is actually not that different to cut four. But um, yeah, so which is also kind of where that is coming through and kind of happens influences. Um, and interesting enough, there is um, with parry four, uh, which is also low second, there is a time there is a typo where Hutton actually calls um, second, like low second parry four, which seems to have been a bit of a Freudian slip that he was still thinking in terms of the stuff he learned growing up. Um, but yeah, that's kind of the difference. So the next thing Hutton has as advanced lessons is feints. And he just says you can faint between any two cuts you like, and then he gives you a list of ones that he thinks is the best, and he has lessons for the receipt of the feint. So you just practice the feints by yourself against a target and then try them out in bounding. I personally think that you'd be better off trying them against an um, opponent or like it with a training partner where you do the feint just but also true cuts to see if you're, you know, your training partner falls from. Um, but Hartman doesn't necessarily do that. He does have interactive lessons for the receipt of the feint because all of his lessons are scripted, which I guess makes sense because all his lessons are scripted. So the, basically you just, you know what's coming, but the instructor is just going to throw a particular feint at you and you just have to resp like, respond correctly. So the idea is I think you get used to seeing what a feint looks like versus what a real cut looks like. Like you, you learn through identification, um, which, yeah, is it's not a bad way to teach. I, in the context of the period, it was probably like where learning science was at the time was probably the best. Um, but yeah, that's his faint lessons, and also his receipt of the faint. Um, that's what he says to how to receive faints. Um, I think they're cool. I find that I still really, I only ever use like one faint at a time, and. The feints I've used have cycled, um, but yeah, I used to use a lot of one two. Now I use a lot of one um, four. 
Um, you know, so I would probably change. Uh, there was a point where I was working on two, three, which Hutton says is a cool one. Um, you know, I personally, I, I don't use a lot of faints, so I only really, you know, have one and I'm pra I kind of have in practice at any given time. Um, I tend to start most of my faints with rising cut. Yeah, you do. And then you mm. Yeah. I think because that's the only way you can realistically uh, faint on the same side. Yeah. It's pretty hard to like. That's yeah. quite awkward. Yeah. Also gets me to lower my hand. Yeah. Um, Which is always a problem for me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Which actually brings us to the next of Hunt's advanced lessons, which is attacks on sword arm. Hunt says this is uh, Hunt says this is one of the ideas he's gotten from Italian fencing. Um, in fact, I'd go so far as to say that Hutton gets more ideas for drills from Italian fencing than he does actual techniques, although he does get a few. There's a few techniques, but he says um, that you should train attacks to the sword arm specifically, and he has a series. He has drills. The first four are all just very uh, attacking um, at different angles around the blade so that you get used to um, basically getting control and feeling how you're moving down the blade different ways, but also the defender will defend. Um, so you have to attack, defend, defend, attack, draw, again, defend. Um, and then the next four are where Hutton brings in false edge cuts, which is something he says he got from the Italians, even though he says it's also a historical thing that was done, um, you know, that was done in previous centuries in Britain. Um, and that seems where, and he often does that as facts. So I might faint one and then do the parries. And then, sorry, that was a bit hard. Ah, yeah, faint one and just tap the arm. Um, or, um, like it's nearly, it's actually, there's, he never opens with a, um, with a false edge cut. Um, see if you can guess why. Yeah, <laughs> that's, that's fine. Um, yeah, that is very vulnerable, so I need to get my opponent to do anything. So I'm going to trust the face and then come in and hit the arm with the false edge. And, Hub is actually one of the things that he's noted about Cold Steel that people thought was really cool back in the day is that he was reintroducing the false edge. Um, yeah, um, it's also one of the, it's one of the few it's one of the few more advanced things he really keeps from Cold Steel into the Swordsman. The Swordsman is, mo is a lot because it's a beginner's ma more of a beginner's manual. Um, he obviously has a lot of like parry repost because that's his favorite thing to do. Um, he has feints because you need them, and then he has false edge cuts because he thinks they're cool. Um, but in Cold Steel, he has them as part of the attacks of the arm. Um, he then has, I'm going to condense here because they're kind of all in similar vein. He has sections on timing, counter timing, um, and counter thrusts. So, counter thrust is where my opponent does something, you know, they create a vulnerability or they give me a target before they've made a threat. And I just take my sword out and whip them. Um, he also has one which is a really nightmare to do here. I give me some space. Just yeah. This uh precise so rare. Uh you're gonna just need to you're gonna have to do this. But where you basically just drop to the ground and come out beneath your opponent. Um and this is again a move that's better for short people and tall people. I have pulled this off. I have never pulled this off against someone who is not my height or taller. Um, but it is cool, and it's also very cool against, like, very aggressive. If you've got someone who's very aggressive, like, it's someone who likes to rush in, this is kind of rad. Well, see, for a kill person, you get more of a reach out of the which is much less safe. <laughs> yes. Because me doing this covers everything. <laughs> yeah. But it also has the time you do this is when someone's coming in really aggressively and open. Like, the times I've pulled this off is when my opponent gets to go on. Ah, and like really tried to kind of and just smash. Like you do get heavy. Not that I'm, there's not like this at the old sword club, but thankfully because culturally it's not how we roll. But you know you do see people who just come in with really big heavy hits on the assumption that it will intimidate their opponent and smash through guards. And this is really good against them because they come in very aggressively, and all of a sudden you're not there, but your sword is in them or poking them. If it's inside them, then there's probably a serious issue. <laughs> Um, but yeah, so that's, those are the sort of the techniques, and then Hutton goes into talking about um, when you use them. So he has timing, where 
is basically you just you just take it, or you just take advantage of an opening. So let's say you know, I'm switching between guards, and Jacob goes, ah, oh, turns it up to go to the inside guard and just boots me on the arm, which is the classic example. But anytime your opponent is doing a thing where they find themselves in distance or find, have an opening that they don't realize, um, is you can time hit them. And then there is counter time where I say I'm going to do that, and I use but I use the fact that I've created an opening to basically take advantage, which is cool. Which is all of knife fighting. <laughs> yes. So yes, if you want to get good at timing, counter timing, do knife fighting. And Hutton has a whole chapter on knife fighting called Steel, um, which yeah is also really is also really awesome. Although I don't think we're going to be able to cover it tonight, looking at how long we've been going. Um, although I did, I've done multiple videos on this, so you can see those about. There's a reason my entire knife fighting game is to stand within reach of someone and hold my hand out. Like, do you want to cut my hand, please? Yeah. <laughs> or, or my face out. Come on. <laughs> yeah, that's. If you want to learn how to do very, very stupidly dangerous things um, safely, knife fighting is great because knife fighting has no low risk, high reward techniques. There are medium oh, risk, way. high reward, and high risk, well there's medium risk, medium reward, and high risk, high reward, and that's it. So yes, I thoroughly recommend you do knife fighting to supplement your things because it teaches you thing not like a will. Um, but yeah, that's, brings us, speaking of tactics, that actually brings us into another chapter, so we're finally out of the same chapter after like an hour and 40 something minutes. Uh, it is half the book. But Hutton actually has a separate chap or like discusses tactics separately. He doesn't say he lists all of these moves and just doesn't say what to do with them half the time. Um, which I think, yeah, is also why I feel like reading Cold Steel and Advance and just reading the manual cover to cover to try and work out what's going on is not great because you're just bombarding yourself with very, very ADD disparate information. But if you go looking for specific things, it's really, really good. So yeah, um, that's I guess my other advice about if you are looking to get into Cold Steel or you can reevaluate it, go through it section by section and pick a thing and then work on like pick a thing to work on and then find that and work on that. Um, it's really not a manual you can read cover to cover um, and get a good sense of. It's just not, which I also think is kind of why there's been a lot of really I would regard it as inaccurate interpretations because I think it's people who are um because you see a lot of bad interpretations by good fences and i feel like a lot of that is that they've read through it they've just read through cold seal as what the fuss is about and because it's a really bad manual for doing that they're you know they're just like oh you know they don't really get get it whereas if you go through section by section um and get those little insights as you go it work it's it reads a lot better um so it is very different to a lot of manuals like that like um i just want to compare it to the 1895. The 1895, you can get a pretty good sense of the system as a whole by reading through it, and not understanding the system as a whole work, you know, works a lot. That means everything, the individual part, makes a lot more sense. Uh, whereas Hutton's very much the opposite: is you want to go section by section. Um, probably so because, like, in very nice with the 1895, that they don't tell it. They tell you what um, how to defend before they tell you what you're defending. Um, so yeah, it's sort of very, I guess, you know, in terms of like the rivalry between the two, or between Hutton and the people writing in the 1895, um, very diametrically opposed sensibilities and manuals, which I find really interesting. Uh, also incidentally, if you've read Cold Steel and decided you didn't like it and came here to try for me to try and talk you out not liking it, um, honestly my advice is if you didn't if you read it and didn't like it, like it didn't click, have a read the 1895 and just see if that clicks. There's already a lot of people doing um, Cold Steel, whereas there are a lot of people who do Massiello, but there's no one who does, like, no one working from the British Massiello manuals from the period. Um, so, yeah, tactical section before I get to off topic. What Hutton basically says is the best fight game is parry riposte. It's his favorite thing to do. When he introduces the chapter on riposte or section on riposte, he says that this is the finest form of fencing, uh, which is why my two stores are dedicated to it. And he says, when you're fencing, the best thing to do is to parry or post. You want to wait for your opponent to attack. When they attack, you want to parry or post them. And then he said, then he talks about what to do if your opponent won't attack. So you've got you have an opponent who's trying to do probably the same thing back to you, which is parry or post. 
And then he, in Cold Steel, what he says is you want to create a false opening. Um, and this is one of the things that really has tripped trip out for a very long time. Uh, you know, like you just you know, make a really little adjustment so it looks like there's a bit of weakness here to come in or something like that. I used to think that this would only ever work on, on a beginner, a very inexperienced fencer. Because once someone's a bit experienced, if you do a false opening, someone's going to be like, oh, I see that false opening. And it's like, we'll see it, but go, oh, this is probably a trap. Um, and, you know, do what I'm actually says do against false openings, which is fake an attack um, and then parry their riposte and counter riposte them. Um, but then as I've got more experience with timing distance and particularly having done um, more, well, actually, epa fencing. I mean, I in theory should do foil, but it's easy to convince people to do epa than it is to convince them to do foil in the behemoth community. So most of that pay, which still works pretty good, um, is learning basically to bait with distance. So if I can borrow Jacob again. Um, if Jacob and I are fencing, I will creep forward. I might do stuff, but I will creep forward, and Jacob particularly being shorter than me, he's actually not too unhappy with me creeping forward more than I would. Mm. Um, and then what I do is I get to maybe back here, where there is a tempting opening that Jacob could go for. It's very subtle. It's, you know, like it looks like even I could just be having a bad day. Yeah. But because I know that Jacob is going to go there, I get to here and make a false opening. Jacob, direct to guard, um, does anything. So he does anything. I parry and repost. And it's that use of distance, that sneaking distance, that um, makes this work and makes this work against experienced fences. And part of why it works is also um, measure. And I think we skipped over this, but Hutton does actually give a breakdown of distance. He talks about measure. He says there are four measures. Um, the thin measure, basically extension distance, where you are you only want to be temporarily because you're at a distance where your opponent can attack you. Perfect measure, lunge distance, which is where you fence from. Um, the out measure, where you're you can't where you can't reach your opponent with a lunge. It's important. For, it's good for changing guards, and it's important to know when you're when you're out of measure of your opponent, but your opponent is at perfect measure of you. And then there's quite a core. Or it's not corpse a corpse, and that's just too fun. To, that's just too fun not to say. That's grappling distance basically. He doesn't really elaborate more than that. Um, with this, with the baiting tactic, what Hutton, um, what you do is you basically get to a point where I'm sneaking forward. And if Jacob, if I get to that here where I'm going to go, and if Jacob hesitates, or Jacob's like, or just stops to try and work out what I'm doing or wondering why I'm creeping forward, I can just get to extension distance and come in. And so basically, I come to a distance where Jacob has to act, yeah. like I'm sneaking in. Um, and that's the other thing that really kind of got me think, rethinking about Hutton is the idea that different fencing, like different saber systems, have different optimal ranges. Like if you watched the last live stream on the 1895, we were constantly running into trouble because, yeah, like, you know, Massiello would say this is too close. When, you know, we need to get back and just absorb into the wall. <laughs> or Jake needs to run up the hallway or something. Um, whereas with Hutton, it's the opposite, is you actually want to creep as close, you actually want to creep in and get close enough that your opponent either has to attack or you can launch a fast enough and uh, uh, an attack fast enough because you're close enough that they're not going to be able to react in time. It's, it's a bit of a game to it, because really what you want to be is far enough that they think they can reach you without lunging, so that they feel like they have to act, Yeah. which will mean that you can, once you've parried, they are incredibly close and very easy to repost against. Yeah, and it's this beautiful sneaking distance game. And this is the thing, I mean, like, if, you know, if I was, you asked me to give a breakdown of what people should do based on the fencing manners I'm familiar with, if you like closer range fencing, Hutton stuff, like the late Hutton, Cold Steel and Swordsman, fantastic, solid gold, just gorgeous. If you want really long range fencing, you're very athletic, you're very tall, you're both, um, then the Massiello drive stuff, I would actually, the 1895 is not the best thing for it, you're actually better off going to Francis V. Wright's translation of Massiello from 1889, or um, potentially even the modern trans like modern translations of Massiello, so like stuff like um, uh, Chris Holtzman um, has done. Um, but yeah, that's kind of a basic kind of if then thing because I would never tell someone do definitely the save manual because anyone who tells me they save manual 
is the best, is trying to sell you something, probably this element. Um, but yeah, that's kind of Hutton's tactics, and that was that was the hardest thing for me to get from the man. Like, I really only feel like I understand what he's actually talking about recently when I've really worked on that baiting game, that sneaking in, and I'm just learning to be close. Um, yes, yeah, so that's kind of the saber section, and he's also got rules for the saber assault. Um, and yeah, then he goes into talking about other weapons, like castle function, great stick, epe, he's got some advanced foil lessons, blindfold foil lessons, which are just really cool. And I'm not going to do them on camera because I'll probably embarrass myself. Um, I, like my foil skills are just not that, are just not there yet, but a future video, future video on like blindfold lessons, I guess. Um, He's also got a section on Epe, um, he's got on Constable's function where he also incorporates a mount boxing, which is kind of cool. He's got a knife section, he's also got a section on um, David Disarm, so if you attack by a knife, which he uses um, Morozzo, so in Renaissance era, like the Bolognese fencing stuff for, um, which is cool. And also another of Hutton's manuals that is very unknown is Hutton actually wrote a jiu-jitsu manual, like Hutton learned jiu-jitsu. Um, Possibly from Edwin Barton Wright, because Hutton actually trained at the Bartitsu Club for a few years. Um, or he was there, he was there for like a year or two when it was open. It was very short lived, but Hutton was there and he was doing stuff. Um, so yeah, he kind of has that grappling, he has a bit of grappling on to he then applies with Renaissance Zero Disarms. Uh, but he also has two, um, but the two chapters we're still, we've got time to talk about today is what to do against what he calls the French sword, um, Epe. It's funny, he only calls it the French sword when he's um, talking about how to oppose it, which I find really interesting. Uh, but basically what he says to do is you just cut more nays at them. You want to make sure that your shell is pointing at their shell so that there's never a point where they can see either the underside or overside of your arm to thrust it. And you just kind of walk at them and take an opportunity if it presents, but otherwise you just kind of keep walking at them and then throw an attack when you feel like it. And the person with the EPA will have a lot of trouble dealing with that. And having done this to people doing EPA, it does work really, really well. Um, I'd be interested to try it against someone who is like an EPA specialist or like a small sword specialist, rather than people who kind of dabble in it. Um, just because, yeah, it's at maybe at really high levels it the game changes, but it's a cool thing otherwise. Um, and then there's Hutton's section on Saber versus Bayonet. Uh, which, as I said, is a section I don't is a section I don't like as much. I think like I think it's the weakest of his advice because what he says basically is um, if you've got saber, what you're primarily taking. Yeah, just wanna have uh, hopefully have enough room to bayonet. it. Um, actually, that's yeah, that'll have to. So what you're looking to kind of take advantage of is if you can get around the tip. Never cracked at their front arm. And he says, particularly, like, you can, a person with a bayonet who's not very experienced will hold it, um, kind of how Jacob's holding it, where the tip, is, the tip is pointed at the middle of me rather than at um, my armpit, um, which means you can get around quite easily, but that's a mistake people learn to stop making very quickly. Um, you can just point it at my armpit. So, this is, I don't know if this is even visible on camera, but Jacob's now pointing about here on me. And that just means that my movement to get around is a lot bigger, which gives Jacob a lot more reaction time. And then if you just, just pull it back like that, no, um, pull it sideways. Compare. Um, so yeah, that Han says you can take advantage of that. A lot of people make that mistake. You can you can try to force that mistake with feints. Um, but he says the problem with the bayonet is if all of my hands are going to be super committed, if Jacob just thrusts at me. I really have to put a, because of the way of the weapon and the fact Jacob has two hands on it, I now need to put a lot of effort into my parry, so my parry is a lot more committed, which is fine for Jacob because now Jacob has a lot more recovery time to deal with my riposte or come back online and do something. And Hutton says basically, and then if Jacob starts beating my sword, like if you just give the, like I just um, you know, particularly if you just get whack to the center line and then come straight down, yeah, like that, like just a basic beat thrust. Um, I'm, you know, like the person with the saber is in a lot of trouble. And so Hutton's advice is you kind of need to, you really need to have a timing advantage and to be able to, ta and to be able to be the aggressor reliably, um, which requires you to be a better fencer, 
So yeah, Hutton's, as much as like, there are a lot of records of Hutton, um, like basically saying, bring foil, bayonet, and saber to, uh, particularly to his military practice. He, apparently he rocked, his first day of being, um, his first day of training at boot camp as a soldier, he rocked up with a bunch of fencing gear, and um, a sergeant who was quite, who was the best fencer in the regiment said, decided to teach him a bit of a lesson for his enthusiasm. And Hutton's just like, all right, well, I'll just grab whatever weapon I want and just come out with whatever weapon you want. And it didn't matter what combination of weapons they had, Hutton was, was able to just completely mince this guy. Um, so Hutton, there's obvious records of Hutton beating people with bayonets using a sabre and also a foil, which is probably more impressive. But his advice is still very much, you relies on you having a huge timing advantage, which is also rendered a lot harder by, um, is also rendered a lot harder by having, um, or by your opponent having a long weapon. Because if I want to, you know, if I like, if I want to pick when we're going, or you know, basically, I want, you know, I need to be at a dis at my happy distance, and that's a lot harder when, you know, Jacob can just yeah throw at me from very far away. So yeah, um, there is probably something to be said that use like being a lot better at timing is the only way to be quite reliable. Is a weapon where they can just deny you playing with their weapon at all. Yeah. In the case, yeah, the only way you're going to win that is judging the time and distance better than I do. Yeah, yeah, true. No, I think that, that is a big, that is a very, that's a very good point. Yeah, um, yeah, if you can just, and that's also a probably a good point for dealing with people who do like medieval systems today. If they're just going to do you know, this sort of stuff where they're just going to deny you, um, you know, deny you an attack. Um, or deny you any, any kind of engagement and just having better time, like being really good at timing is really helpful, um, which is something you get from foil fencing. So yeah, if you strike. Another reason if you are a silver, like a hemo saber fencer, another reason to cross train foil. And knife. Yeah, oh yeah, and knife. Actually knife is also good for it. In fact, if you want to cross train, if you've been doing hemo saber and you want to cross train something, I recommend cross training Probably Epe is a much easier sell for the in the Hema community than foil is. Um, but like Epe and knife or foil and knife, um, because those give you the best attributes to take to other things. Although specifically not medieval though. No, it's That's a very different game. <laughs> yeah. Do period stuff. So also and also with um, Epe and Foil. Get 19th century Epe and Foil manuals. Um, modern stuff is not too bad. I find generally small sword doesn't work anywhere near as well because what was being done back in the 18th century is not necessarily equivalent. Although that problem that might depend on systems well. Like I find hope is particularly bad to cross train. Like you just don't get people who cross train hope or hope small sword to try and um, up their save again generally don't get the sorts of benefits mm -hmm. you see from um, people who do like you know for like 19th century, 20th century foil on Epe. Um, but yeah, I also just think that from like a historiography perspective, like a um, historicity perspective, cross training period systems is much, much better. So yeah, um, that's kind of a lot of cold steel in a nutshell. Um, yeah, I guess my main feels from it is it makes a lot more sense if you know the stuff Hutton's missing out. Like Hutton. You know, for set, to get a sense of how much you need to know beforehand, Hutton doesn't actually tell you how to lunge in cold steel. He doesn't. He doesn't specify. He just says to do it because he expects you know how to lunge from having done foil fencing. Um, he also makes references to guards like the guard of six that he doesn't actually describe. He has a pair of six, but that's you know an active movement that you don't ever really lie and hang around in. Um, so yeah, um, but guard of six is really, really common in foil fencing where people would sit in either six or cart in the period and fence from there. Does he discuss when it's better to cut, uh, cut over those disengage? Is that being... uh, yeah, so he says, dis he says you disengage if you want to change size for a thrust and you cut over if you want to change size for a cut. Kind of, that is in there. Yeah, he, he doesn't specify how to disengage or how to cut over. But he said, actually, he describes what they are. So he does, he does describe what they are, but he doesn't really give more than just a very basic breakdown. Um, yeah. So. Yeah, it was. Um, but yeah, there is a bunch of stuff that he just doesn't explain because he expects you already know it. And 
I think if you're coming to Cold Steel as a beginner, you at the very least need to get a foil manual so that you can read up on what that stuff is. Um, and you might even need to cross strain some foil or epay just to kind of get it. Um, but at the same time, there are much better maps, say, like British Save Manuals for Beginners. Uh, if you want to stick with Hutton, the Swordsman is great. Uh, if you want, if you're not, if not, you can always go to um, Alice and Win, um, especially if you want something that doesn't, that doesn't really require foil um, to train foil fencing. Like the Swordsman does still suggest you train foil first. It just has a foil chapter. Um, Alice and Win doesn't, it just has a very, very basic um, sword system. It is a bit more old school than um, Hutton's was in period. Um, weight is. I've heard some people say Wade is not too beginner friendly. I didn't really read, right? I, when I read Wade, I was definitely not a beginner. So, um, yeah, probably not the best one to go to. Um, if you're wanting to do later period stuff, Rowworth is actually, Rowworth is not too bad. Um, and Cold Steel is not a bad advanced manual if you've already started with Rowworth. Just they're at opposite ends of the century. Um, although that's it, Hutton does actually reference Rowworth directly. So, there are, pro there are probably plenty of people who are training Hut and Saber who also had read and trained, had read Rowworth, but obviously the inverse is not true. Um, but yeah, um, like, um, otherwise, if you're, otherwise you could also look at the um, standard French method, so um, get the 1877 French fencing, military fencing manual, uh, which I should mention Chris Lee and Long Edge Press purely because um, Chris Slee does French fencing and has done a lot of really cool translation stuff on Long Edge Press and has also promised to come out to New South Wales and kick my ass from mispronouncing the French language for all these live streams. So if you want someone to get, come down from Queensland and kick my ass, Long Edge Press. Um, but yeah, it's, that was actually, that military manual became a really standard manual. You see English language translations from it, of it, like even in the period. Um, but yeah, that's, Pretty much what I recommend if you want to start, if you want a starting point, if you want a really good advanced manual though, Cold Steel is rad. Um, yeah, like there's nothing in it that isn't technically sound, um, which that's pretty normal. There's stuff that's really arsy. Like, like I said, I don't agree. I think the bayonet advice really relies on you being a better fencer and the commander thing really, really relies on you. I don't think that would work in a modern human context where people are used to grappling, I think. A big part of why Hutton's able to get it off is because people just didn't grapple in um, like 19th century fencing cells, so they weren't they didn't ex they'd come close and they'd expect basically to stall out because of how close they were and have someone just go ha ha probably caught a lot of people by surprise. Um, but yeah, like it is this there's stuff in there that is arsy that is like you know a very very low percentage. Um, I'm not saying that it can't work, just that you wouldn't really commonly do it. And Hutton's usually pretty good about saying this is just not a common occurrence. Like he says outright of, of um, commanding and of grappling, it's just not a thing that really happens very much in fencing cells. Um, and he says of soldiers in the field, because this was, as much as this was never a standard military manual, uh, like this was a civilian fencing manual, that's not as big a distinction as you might think in the period. Like this is the great age of the British Empire, British militarism, and a big part of what Hutton's hoping to do with civilian fencing was um, basically create a fertile ground for uh, recruits to the British Army to, or to the British Army and Navy, like the military in general. Um, basically, um, by having them or having a lot, as many people trained in Sabre as possible, or like have people who are already skilled at fencing before they went into the military. I mean, he explicitly justifies. Um, teaching fencing in um, British schools on those grounds. Um, and yeah, um, yeah, that's like, when we talk about this as British military sabre, it is and it isn't in that a lot of British soldiers probably knew this system going into the field because they trained it as civilians, um, but also this was never a standard military manual, this was but Cold Steel was incredibly popular in civilian fencing circles. Um, so yeah, so if there's any questions, now is a good time to ask them. Um, you know, I am you know, going to quickly grab a drink because I've been talking for two hours straight. Uh, if you have any questions, please ask them. They can be technical questions, history questions. Um, I 
if you want another live stream, let me know. I kind of want to do another live stream breaking down each section in a lot more detail. Because like, particularly with the parries where, you know, I only got really to show you what they were and then kind of roughly how they work. But there's a lot of beauty and a lot of really interesting stuff in each individual parry where you learn what reposts um, are possible from it. And yeah, if I broke that down, we would never, we would be here all night, which I'm happy to talk for, about hunting for like 12 hours straight, but also, you know, that's not really viable um, when we have to work. So yeah, anyway, if you have any questions, now's the time. Um, yeah, I'm gonna grab a drink. I'm staying around for you to, to do a 12 hour live stream. Well, it doesn't have to be 12 hours. We can just go, we can just go until like 4.15. Um, it's true. We can get a whole five minutes of sleep. <laughs> um, it's early, this is tea, just in a big mug. I know. I've had a lot of people ask me if I drink soup during the, the live streams, which is no, I just, it's easier just to have a big mug of tea um, because it stays warm for longer and also because it means I don't have to constantly make me cups of tea. Well, that one's been out for a while. It can't still be warm. It was not, but I was hoping that, like, movie magic would disguise that. <laughs> but no, you've, you've spoiled my Eugene Sherrard. Alright, um, cool. So, yeah, um, cool. If there's no further questions or anything, we can just leave it here. Um, we are doing another live stream in, a good, in two weeks on Richard Bowden, so um, something, something, I wish you'd see what that is. Ah, cool. And Mick said, thanks too much for my little saber brain. See you Saturday. Uh, hopefully your brain is to digested it by then. But yes, um, on Saturday, if you are in Sydney, we are meeting up at Haverfield Netball Courts to do some fencing. So you're all welcome to come join us and try some of this stuff out and kind of see it in action. Um, and yeah, otherwise, um, we're back uh, in two weeks with Richard Burton's system, which really interesting system. Um, it's like, again, it's one of those ones that I didn't really understand for ages. Although this time, it wasn't until I started looking at French Saber and getting really interested in French Saber that I really understood where Burton was coming from with it and could actually place it within the lineage, like, or within like, not only term lineage, but like with the progressions and the sort of, the great sort of sea of influences and ideas that is um, that is um, British or English language transfer manuals, um, and yeah, um, so um, that's going to be really really interesting because Burton Burton's manual is really controversial today because he spends the first half of it snack talking the Angelo school, <laughs> um, where he's just like he's yeah, uh, which B is like for you know. Even though there's very few people who directly practice Angelo fencing, um, there's a lot of people who, like most British, fet, or like nearly all British saber fencing through the 19th century is derived from Angelo. Like, um, Hutton actually studied with Henry Angelo the Younger, um, although Hutton would have had to study with him for in the last like in the last like year or two of his life. Uh, like, there's a little bit of overlap, but there's a lot of sources that say Henry that he that Hutton actually learned directly from. Henry Angelo the Younger, so we assume that the dude was teaching right up until, like, right up until he died, which, you mean he died in, like, he died in his, like, 70s, so that's not that unreasonable. Um, also, you know, if I, could, if I can fence up until the day I die, I'd be happy, but, yeah. Um, yeah, so Hutton, Hutton also very, says very, very clearly that he is working from the Angelo Saber school. Like, he's work, he is doing what, he's doing Saber was using Angelo Saber as a starting point for Cold Steel and then adding in stuff from 18th century Backsword and a little bit of stuff from um, Italian Saber. And I know there's a lot of things today where a lot of people say that Hutton is bastardized Italian Saber. Uh, that was also a confusion in the period where people were like, oh, Hutton is not representing Italian Saber properly. And then um, there's a lot of commentary from people like, hey, have you actually read this? He doesn't, he only, he specifies everything that, the, that is Italian in his system, that's not much. And then in later speeches and stuff, um, like there's actually a few speeches that have been recorded of Hutton's where he speaks to uh, panels of military experts and panels of military officers, and he's like, 
a little bit of my system is derived from Italian. Like he seems to be really specifying that there's only bits of Italian influence. I think that's because people are actually making the same mistake back then that they make now when they think that Hutton is doing some kind of derived Italian system when he's not. <laughs> he's doing like Angelo Saver mixed with 18th century backsword and then adding some Italian stuff because he thinks it's cool. Because Hutton is also like just a massive nerd. Um, <laughs> Truly the first team I <laughs> I mean, definitely an early one. Um, also, I keep bringing up French stuff. And um, as much as Hutton is seen as the first team roast, he's not. Um, Hutton actually got got a bunch of his ideas and a bunch of his start with his Hema stuff. Uh, well, he got it from Edith and Castle, like the two of them fencing together in Castle. And actually, in the period, Castle was, re was more recognised as a fencing historian than Hutton was. Um, like when people talk about fencing history, they talk about Castle and Hutton. Um, well, the two are very close. Like um, Hutton dedicates Cold Steel to Castle, which is just kind of cute. Um, but yeah, Castle got a lot of his ideas from the French and from the French 19th century Hema scene, which doesn't get mentioned very much in the modern Hema scene that, that the earliest people doing um, revivals of medieval and renaissance fencing in the 19th century was in France, people like um, Adolf Courtney and whatnot. So yeah, that's maybe not the first team risk because I suspect that every, I suspect anyone who just decides to like revive historical manuals for their fencing is probably a massive nerd. And yes, I'm calling both of us out. <laughs> um, and everyone in the audience, you're all nerds. Um, yeah, so that's the thing I also think is worth mentioning, uh, just because I think French fencing in here is generally neglected, but particularly like there's a lot of the, French, the impact of French fencing on particularly um, 19th century fencing is quite massive. Um, like, yeah, like, you know, Hutton's foil, like when he talks about foil and Epe, he basically said, like, when he recommends other manuals, he primarily recommends manuals that are. Um, you know, that were in the period um, in French. Um, although with the standard French military, there is a translation, it's an English translation from the period. Um, yeah, so that's kind of using another figure. And anyway, I think we've finished up for questions and it's been a while. So yeah, hopefully some of you can join us in the park on Saturday. Um, I'll post details to the event tonight or tomorrow um, or another day, one of them. Um, and yeah, if you can join us again two weeks when we look at Richard Burton, you can see it, and we can see you know a bit more sort of you know controversial fencing history from, from another sort of period human drama. So yeah, thank you all for coming. Uh, like, share, and subscribe, and I don't know how to end these fucking things. So yeah, um, great internet personality. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm just the best. Um, someone said, "Oh, Paul Tectomo was earlier. He collected so many sources. He has gone broke." Yeah, I. Well, that's a, that's another lecture that I probably want to do another time, but whether it counts as historical that early uh, gets a bit weird because books would stay in circulation and in use for, you know, much, much longer because there's just fewer of them. So, yeah. yeah. Do like the uh, European fencing traditions that go back ages, is that HEMA or is that just a living tradition that's part of their modern fencing curriculum. Yeah. <laughs> or is it an oral history, in which case it is both. <laughs> yeah. I, what is what is and isn't HEMA is that's a whole other live stream. And it's the more historical method I do, the more confusing it is. So that's going to have to wait. But yeah, I'll catch you all.